Welcome one, welcome all. Welcome to another exciting episode of Games Explained on the Sound Strategy Network. I am Bridger, and today we're here in Stavka, the Soviet HQ, to talk about this game, No Retreat. The Russian Front. This is a game about the Eastern Front of World War II by GMT Games. Now, it's a board game, but we're going to be playing the online version using a program called Vassal. And we are going to be doing a quick overview of the game mechanics, and then we're going to be playing through the first five turns or so, which takes us through late 1941, early 1942, the assault on Moscow. It turns out pretty interestingly, I think. So... Let's jump into it. My friend Alex, a.k.a. Ruokbla, from the Legacy Gaming Community, is joining me. He has never played this game before, so let's begin. If you zoom out to see the whole board, you can see on the top right is the turn track. That has reinforcements, but also special events and other important things on it that tell us what happens in various points in the, in the time. Then underneath that is the victory uh, point pause. track. The turn track, turn record track, is that what you're looking yep, for? Yep, turn record track, that's correct. It's got a bunch of units okay. on it for various turns when they come in as reinforcements. Okay. We'll, okay. We'll, we'll look at that in more detail in a minute. Um, and then underneath that is the victory point track. We'll also look into that in more detail. Then underneath that are the boxes to hold units that have been kicked off the board because either they've been so badly damaged that they're considered shattered or they've been destroyed or they have surrendered. Uh, and there's a distinction between those. Underneath that is a uh, a copy of the terrain uh, effects chart. And there's also a terrain effects chart in the far top left. That's the same exact chart. It's just condensed so it works, uh, you know, left and right. That is pretty much everything that is on the map, uh, just out on the side so you can see. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit more and then let's look at... Uh, some of these things in general. So right-clicking around the map is the best way to quickly go from one place to another. It'll try to center on wherever you right-click. Uh, unfortunately, there's no click and drag, which bugs the hell out of me um, in terms of, like, dragging the screen around. Uh, but anyway, so let's talk a little bit about... How much do you know about uh, the Russian front in World War II? Um, it existed. <laughs> okay. So historically, what happened was the Germans had surprise along a 1,000 mile front and they took great advantage of it and it advanced rapidly in the first year, the first summer I should say, and they were on the gates of Moscow in the winter of 1942. And I know you've heard of Russian winters are bad, but the 1942 winter was very, very, very bad. And the German high command had not prepared for it properly. They did not have the cold weather gear that was necessary for their three million men on this front. The Soviets, however, of course, did, uh, and they did much better in the winter of 1941 to 42, and they stopped the Germans on, like, literally, like, 13 miles from the Kremlin. It was really close. And... So in the winter, they made a few counterattacks and they got a bunch of reinforcements from Siberia that showed up at exactly the same time. And the Germans were kind of stalled outside of Moscow. So in 1942, in the summer, they pushed way deep in the south. And then towards the winter again, the Soviets pushed back. And in the 1943, the Germans tried another offensive. Uh, by the way, the 42 offensive where the Soviets pushed back, you might have heard of it. It's called the Battle of Stalingrad. Um, in 1943, the Germans again tried to push forward, but they didn't uh, have the, the, the same strength that they had at the beginning of the war and eventually by 1944 and 45 they were getting pushed all the way back into Germany so this was a battle where you have the Germans really strong at the beginning and the Russians really weak and the Germans pushing way deep into Russian territory and then getting pushed way back to their territory over the course of the war so the way that the victory is set up models that concept so the way that there are a couple of ways that the game can end instantly if one side is doing really well. And I'll get to those in a second. They're like the sudden death victory conditions. But the typical way that it would go is for the first 11 turns, the Germans are going to push and take as many cities as possible. Cities are their victory points for the most part. They're going to try and get as many victory points as possible. On turn 12, we mark where the German victory point is at. So say they're at 21 points on turn 12. We would mark that down. And then we change the initiative to the Russian initiative and now we count victory points from their perspective how many cities do they have and at the end of 11 more turns we see where they are in comparison to where the Germans were in their first 11 turns and then if the um, 
if the Russians were able to catch up to or exceed the Germans, then we go into 1945 for the final year of the war, and the Germans just try to hold out without losing in that year. If they can hold out without losing Berlin or without losing uh, the, the, the other sudden death victory conditions, then they win. Otherwise, the Soviets win. Um, but earlier I mentioned if the Soviets could beat the German first 11 turns, they would continue on the game. If the Germans marked a high water mark at 25 and the Soviets were only able to get to 24 by turn 22, I guess it would be, then the Germans win. So that's how that works. More specifically, victory points are counted by cities that you control. That's the gray hexes with all the little dots in them. Those are cities. Um, mm -hmm. You can also see there are two oiled field hexes on the map. One is in the far bottom right in the Caucasus. The other one is in Romania near Bucharest in the, in, on the left, just the north uh, east of the Black Sea. Do you see those? Mm -hmm. Those yep. are each victory points as well. And if you capture those, you're a, uh, the opponent loses a card draw because the oil fields were very important to both sides. Um, now, the other ways that I mentioned that you can win... Uh, oh, let me finish the victory point thing, actually. So, victory points are cities and oil fields on the map. You also get a victory point for destroying an enemy unit when it's out of supply. And I'll go deeper into the supply mechanics later, but just know that if you can force an enemy unit to go out of supply and then eliminate it, that is worth a victory point. The other way that you might get victory points is as a result, is as a result of card plays. The other ways uh, that we keep track of victory points is sometimes if you see on the turn record track on the far top right there, there's some of those turns have red words on them like D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, Rhine Crossed. You see those? Mm -hmm. Those represent things happening that are bad for the Axis on other fronts of the war, and the uh, Soviet player gets one victory point whenever those happen. There's some earlier in the turn record track that you can't see because it's covered up by all the... Uh, the, the, the things there, but as we progress through them, the Soviets will gain points over the course of the game from those events. So those are the, all the different ways that you can get victory points. Sorry, one more. Finland on the very top of the map. Finland is ostensibly a Axis ally in this fight, but they didn't do much fighting outside of Finland. They pushed the, the Soviets back when the Soviets entered into Finland, but they wouldn't really leave Finland. So Finland's army is represented by a single fort unit there. And if the, the Germans bring a German unit and simply walk into and occupy Finland, they get one victory point as long as that unit is there. Later in the game, when the Soviets get strong enough, if they knock out the Finnish fort and sit one of their units in Finland, they get a victory point as long as that unit stays there. Okay, that's the last way to get victory points. Now, I mentioned there's some ways to get a victory without victory points. If you look on the German side, you can see there are three, four hexes that have uh, red borders. Berlin, Konigsberg, Prague, and Vienna. You see those? Mm -hmm. If the Soviet player ever captures three of them, and then we get to the beginning of a new turn, that's when we check for victory, they win, win instantly if they have three of those in their possession on the beginning of a new turn. Likewise, what was cities again? Uh, Prague, Vienna, Berlin, and Konigsberg on the far northeast of the map. Okay. And the Germans have similar victory conditions. There are five strategic hexes inside of Russia. Three are in the south, Sevastopol, Stalingrad, and the oil fields. And then Moscow, of course, is a strategic hex. And up in the north, Leningrad is a strategic hex. If the Germans can get three of those at the beginning of a new turn, they win instantly. So Stalingrad... Oil field, Moscow, what were the other two? Uh, Sevastopol is on the Black Sea in the south. Okay, okay. And then Leningrad is up near Finland in the north. Okay. Those were historically major targets for the Germans. They also historically captured none of them except for Sevastopol, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, that's one of the sudden death instant victory conditions if you can get those things. Uh, the other ones you can see on the actual turn uh, victory point track itself. Um, you can see at the 20 victory point mark, there's a little thing that has a skull and crossbones, and it's gray, uh, and it has a, a, an iron cross, and it says T3. So at the beginning of turn three, we check, and if the German player has more than 20 points, then they win instantly. And it, on turn six, we check and see if the German player has more than 23 points, 
they win instantly. And we keep checking these every three turns throughout the game to see if somebody wins instantly. Um, and typically, that is a very, very difficult thing to accomplish and only happens if one player has completely destroyed the other um, due to tactical errors and things like that. Um, so that's, okay. the, that's the only other way to win. Typically, it's going to end from an objective uh, you know, control of those three of those hexes, or it's going to end by checking those VP counters at the end of the game. All right? Roger that. Okay, so let's take a look at the top of the screen. You got the markers button. That just allows us to pull markers out. You can ignore that. The card decks will let you see the draw and discard pile. Some of the cards will say things like, go through the discard pile and pull out a card of your choice and put it in your hand. So that's where you can get to if you need to do that. You can pull up your hand, the Soviet hand, and draw cards and you'll see what they look like. Oh, you're the German player. That's right. You're the, that's right. So go ahead and open the Axis hand and then click draw card a couple of times. And you, you can interact with most things in the game by right clicking on them. So uh, by default, your cards are masked to me. I can op the, open up the Axis hand, but all I see is the back of the card. If you right click on it and click mask, it'll unmask it. Uh, you can also use the hot keys that are listed there. Control F will mask and unmask it. Um, so if uh, something says, oh, your opponent has to show you your hand, that's how you would do it. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So, can I draw every card that I give the option to? Is there any reason not to? Uh, well, the rules only let you draw so many cards. But I think uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it gives you a ton. You're never going to need to draw more than, you're never going to need to see more than six. Okay, so uh, the fact that I've only drawn two doesn't hurt anything right now. No, no, no. We're going to reset this whole thing before we actually start. So we can mess around with the interface. Okay. okay. It's just a couple clicks to reset it. So the way that these cards work is you're going to uh, use them either for the item that is printed on it, the event that is listed, that'll give you some benefit, or you can discard them to do varying things. They're considered your resources, essentially. So you're either going to use them for the stated item, or you can discard them to, for example, bring units back on the field as reinforcements, or put some guys on a train and ship them somewhere, because you're going to use the fuel and the, and the shipping resources uh, that are associated with the card. Um, and it's it, typically these things are just going to be like, discard one card to do this, discard two cards to do that. Um, so that's what the cards are going to be used for. Now, there's a top uh, section and a bottom section. As the German player, you're only going to look at the top section. You completely ignore the bottom one and, and vice versa for me. So okay. in the first 11 turns, any cards with the iron cross, the black cross on it, are playable. Um, in the second 11 turns... Cards with the red star are playable, and iron cross cards are not. Sorry, I should say not playable for their event. So they become just cards that you would discard for some effect. Um, so anything that has a red star on the top of it, you can ignore that event for the first 11 turns. It's not going to be useful. It literally doesn't work. And that's simply to represent events that were possible when Germany was, was really powering in, and then events that were possible when the Soviet Union was taking over the initiative. And what about cards that have neither? Can be played during any, uh, either uh, set of turns. So they are okay. things that represented that happened basically throughout the war. Um, so for example, I have one here that says inexperienced Soviet officers. It's got a iron cross on it because that event only takes place in the first half of the war because they didn't have as many experience, inexperienced Soviet officers. They had many more experienced officers in the later part of the war. Okay, so that's how those cards work, and I'll explain what you need to discard them for in a second, but just so you know, now you can close that if you want, but you get the idea. Um, you can ignore the out-of-play box. There's two more boxes that are right after that that are very important. The combat and sequence of play charts are very useful, um, and I think I want them bigger, but I don't want them at 100%, so I'm going to change the zoom to 70 and see if I like that. Uh, a little more. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. I know what just happened. All right, I'm going to change the zoom to 80. Try that. There we go. All right, so yes, we have the sequence of play. 
that also has the combat results table. You can see your combat results table and mine are different. I can tell you yours is much better <laughs> as, the, as the axis. Next up is the terrain effects chart, and we'll get back to that later. Then there's a button that lets you roll a die. I roll a one, I roll a two, I roll a four. That's about the only reason you'll want to be able to see the chat box at the very top of the screen there, because that's where those dice roll results show up. Unless I ever need to hit markers button, which... Yes, that's the other reason. Um, now, the other useful buttons here, if you see hide pieces, that will make all the pieces disappear so you can see the underlying terrain, which is really useful when you're planning movement and there's a bunch of units in the way. And then there's a mini-map you could bring up if you wanted. I never use it because I just use right-click to get around places. And if you move units, they get a little flag on them showing that they've moved. I'm moving a unit around Minsk in the middle of the map. Do you see that? I do. Do you see how it's green and it's got a little trail behind it? If you press the move button, it resets all those flags. So that's what that button does. So after your movement phase, we can press that and reset everything. That's just to help you keep track of where that, whether, which units you've moved so far. And it helps show me the path you've taken to move them. So I can say, oh yeah, you're, you're, being, you're making an illegal path here. No, you can't have Moscow that way. That's not how you get to Moscow. <laughs> all right. So uh, the next thing, drag one of your units on top of another one of your units. Well, you've already done it with one of my units there. Which ones are mine? Yours are the gray ones. Germans are gray. All right. So click off of it. Uh, and now you can see you've got a stack. If you click off of it and then click back on it again, it'll select both things and you can move them both together. To select an individual thing, double click the stack and it sort of expands it. And then you can single click as well as if you wanted to shift click units to select multiples within a stack without having to select the whole thing. And now you're making pretty pictures with the move I orders. <laughs> it's a super Triforce. That's not the only place it comes from, Streisel. I've also read Band of Brothers and a couple other books, books on World War II. He says all my World War II knowledge comes from Company of Heroes, Call of Duty, and World at War. <laughs> That's not it. All right. So I'm going to erase your thing here. Um, Who, who's Streisel? Streisel is one of the guys in the chat room that usually hangs out and says says stuff when I'm doing streaming. He's like, oh, he's like my bro. Okay. He's in your stream. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So let's start talking about the actual game now. So open up the sequence of play button. That's the one that's right next to the out of play button combat and sequence of play chart if you have a second monitor it's useful to put this out in the second monitor i'll leave it out here so people can see it so the sequence of play is listed in that sort of uh tan box there and we do the new game turn where we advance the turn marker if there are any events listed on the new game turn we just check them then we check for victory then we do the axis player turn which you can see is listed entirely there cards supply organization movement combat removals detraining then the soviet player does exactly those same things in that order card supply organization movement combat removals detraining and then we go to the next game turn so the cards phase is very simple whatever cards you have left over from your previous turn you discard down to two then you draw four so you'll have six maximum um, then we do a supply check. Is there any reason not to want to draw no, all cards? you always want to draw all your cards. Okay. You'll unfortunately probably sometimes not want to discard your cards, but you have to discard down to two. So you can only keep two cards from turn to turn. Um, okay. Then we do a supply check. Uh, and units that are out of supply are marked out of supply in this uh, this phase. And then we do the organization step, which is when you can bring in reinforcements or when you can try to strengthen your troops by flipping them over to their stronger side if they've been weakened. Uh, and then you do movement. Uh, so we're taking it as the Axis player right now. So you would do all your moves. Then you would declare all the places that you wanted to attack. Then I would declare any spoiling attacks I was making to try and draw off some strength to your main attacks. And those cost me cards in order to play. And then we would actually resolve each of those combats individually. And then we would... Uh, How do we choose... Should it matter which way we choose to resolve combats? Uh, you would choose the order in order to resolve them. It doesn't usually matter which order you resolve okay. them in. Okay. Uh, but sometimes it can. You can blast through one area and exploit to get behind my line, and then doing so blocks my retreat on another combat, so my units have to die. Okay. Okay. Then, after we're done with combat, we check... 
any units that were marked out of supply at the beginning of your turn are now considered out of supply and destroyed and removed from the map. And they are considered to have surrendered and they will grant one victory point to the other side for surrendering. Um, now, it's important to know that even though it's your turn, we check supply for both sides and then both sides would lose units at the end of your turn. And then on my turn, we'd again check for supply for both sides and both sides would lose unit, units at the end of the turn. Um, so I'll go deeper into each of these one at a time. So the cards thing, very self-explanatory. Let's talk about supply. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, so supply works like this. Let's use an example. Um, I'm going to use the unit here near Minsk, right? So a unit, uh, let's pretend that uh, Minsk is under your control for the purposes of this exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, first, you'll notice there's a red line on the far right side of the map going all the way down and on the bottom as well. You see that? Let me back out. Yes. That is the Soviet supply source. That is where all supplies come from for the Soviets. On the far left, on the far east, is a blue line representing the German supply source in Greater Germany. West. I'm sorry, West, yes. Blech. Continue. <laughs> yep. Oh, I see Streisel. Streisel wasn't putting me down. He said all his knowledge from World War II comes from those games. Uh, okay, anyway. So, if I've got this Minsk unit and I put it uh, and I want to get supply to it, I have to trace a four hex chain, including the, the place that I'm going to, um, to a supply source. Obviously, this unit that's next to Minsk is way more than four hexes away from the edge of the board. If it was four hexes from the edge of the board, I would be able to trace supply directly to the edge of the board. I'd be fine. But as I am not directly next to the edge of the board, I can trace supply to a nearby city, let's say Smolensk. So my supply would trace like this. And then from Smolensk, I can trace a path of infinite distance back to the red uh, section of the board. Now, the important distinction here is that when I trace the supply from the unit to a city, I can trace in any direction so long as it's not longer than four hexes. When I trace from the city back to the red border, I can only have the city trace directly east, northeast, or southeast. So what that means is, let me use an example. This, I see. The, the, it could not trace like that. That's an illegal trace. I would have to trace only in the directions northeast, southeast, and east. Um, and to help you remind you, it's, there's a thing on the far left to try to remind you. And that applies to city supply only. And that represents the railway networks uh, in the thing. It's very abstracted. So... The reason that's important is if you had a unit right here, Smolensk would not be a supply source because it could not trace supply. And the reason is all units have something called a zone of control. If you imagine uh, the six hexes mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. a unit, that's called the unit's zone of control. They are projecting power into those hexes so that supplies can't get through, amongst other things. Um, and that's probably the most important effect of a zone of control. Um, so I'll get to zone, more zone of control stuff in a second, but we'll just talk about it as it relates to supply right now. So this unit is blocking uh, the supply from going through all of these hexes because it has a zone of control there, right? So Smolensk can't act as a supply source because you cannot trace through these zones of control. Now, this allows it to become a supply source again because friendly units will block an enemy zone of control for the hex that they are in. So Smolensk can now tra trace its supplies through those friendly units on to, into Tula and then all the way to the edge of the board. Uh, but if that unit moved away, it would be blocked again. Actually, no, that's this not is, true. Yeah, because it has this spot right below it. It has that spot right below it, yes. That's correct. So it sounds like you've grasped how the, uh, the supplies work. Now, um, so this would be cutting that unit off from supply. Correct, because this it could not trace here. And oops, sorry. Sometimes my thing gets cut. There we go. It cannot trace here. Cannot trace there. If you have units on opposite sides of it, you're always going to be cutting it off from supply. Unless I get a unit there, now it's back in supply. So if on your turn 
you manage to surround the West unit like that, and then we'd mark it out of supply because, oh, it's the beginning of my turn. We have to check supply and we have to mark it out of supply. It's out of supply. Oh, but on my turn, I go, oh, da 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 Let's ignore the fact that that was more movement points than this unit actually has. Uh, now it's back in supply. At the end of my turn, we would remove that marker and he's fine. Well, on my turn, though, because we, don't we recheck supply at the end of my turn, near the end of my turn? And that unit would be can still out of supply, so it would be gone? Well, no, hang on. So, on you, at, the, at the end of your turn, you've surrounded my unit. Um, and we check supply again at the end of your turn, but the only thing we do at the end of the turn is remove any units that are still out of supply. We mark units out of supply at the beginning, remove them at the end. So the idea is on your turn, you put my guy out of supply. Then at the beginning of my turn, he's marked out of supply. He has one turn. He's got a ticking clock. He's got to get back in supply by the end of my turn or he's gone. So on my turn, uh, I have a unit here, let's say. And on my turn, I do this. And now my guy's back in supply. So at the end of my turn, he's okay. And we don't have to remove him. And we can remove the out of supply marker because he's tracing through my friendly unit. Then down here, down here, and then over to Smolensk. Okay. Because that's a four hex range. Um, now, there are a couple of edge cases in supply. Do you have any other questions about what I've talked about so far? No. Nope. Okay, there's a couple of edge cases in supply. And I will try to set up an example here in the south. Let's say that uh, I'm going to drop a control marker into Kharkov. So Kharkov is a German city, right? And... Uh, I've got a unit here. Uh, and let's also say that Dieppner, Dieppner is also a German city. I'm moving all the Germans out of the way just to avoid confusion with zones of control for the moment. Because cities don't have zones of control. So okay. let's say that this unit is right here. Um, and it is right on the edge because it can do a four hex trace to Voronezh in the direct east. And it can also go to the northeast and go to Smolensk. Right? So it's okay. If it moves here, it's mm -hmm. out of supply. But there is one exception to this. This unit that is right on the edge of a four hex trace can extend supply to one more unit, one more distance. So these three units here could all claim to be in supply, even if let's say Smolensk was also a German control situation. Uh, these three units are able to draw supply from the Bryansk unit, which is itself able to get supply from Voronez. Voronez? Be because um, you're not specifically stating this, I'm guessing this unit would now no longer be in supply. Correct. This, this like, sort of uh, snake tail end only applies one hex from the four. So it can only go, it can stretch to five, but only if there's a unit in the fourth hex to, to get you the rest of the way. And of course, they're all screwed if there's a German here cutting them off do, via, via his uh, zone of control. Now, okay. uh, there's a couple other edge cases, and then I want to talk one more important piece about uh, zones of control and supply and how we check it. So the other edge cases... The other places that can provide supply. Finland is, uh, the Finnish unit is always in supply in Finland and it can't leave Finland. Uh, the Hungarian units and the Axis allies all draw supply from Germany. Uh, except for some small exceptions that happen way later in the game. We'll talk about them when they come. Um, all right. And the last supply cases are sea supply. So if we look down in the Black Sea, the Black Sea, any unit that's on a coastal hex of the Black Sea is always considered to be in supply. So even if you had this unit completely surrounded with the Germans all the way around it, it's still considered to be in supply because it can get supply directly from the Black Sea. Uh, however, and that's true for both sides as far as the Black Sea is concerned, the Sea of Azov does not count. Uh, only the actual Black Sea coastal hexes. Okay. And that goes for both sides. However, if this unit was trapped in Odessa... And another unit was trying to draw supply from Odessa, but Odessa was blocked uh, due to uh, zone of control, for example. Um, Odessa itself, as a city, in order to extend its... Let's say this is the situation. And it's trying to provide a, uh, supply to this southern unit here. The south unit can't trace to Odessa because Odessa can't trace back a land supply to the edge of the map. 
So sea supply only counts for units on the coast. It doesn't extend past the coast. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Then the Caspian Sea in the far south, uh, southeast is a supply source mm-hmm. for the Russians only. The Baltic Sea in the north is a supply source for both sides. Sorry, it's always a supply source for the Germans. It's also a supply source for the Soviets if they have Leningrad and Leningrad is in supply. One more thing that's important. You can trace supply through uh, lake hexes, but not through sea hexes. Uh, In the example of Leningrad, if the Germans come over here, Leningrad is still in supply because even though this German is getting a zone of control out to there, uh, Leningrad is actually getting supply that way. Does that make sense? And then from there back to the edge of the map. So in order to put Leningrad out of supply, the Germans have to get here and get their zone of control there in order to control it. Now they can put Leningrad out of supply. Now let's go south, though. Let's go south. Would that be in supply? Uh, The 6th Army unit here? Uh, no, no. With this, uh, this city, if this was a uh, oh, okay, ger- the Russian city would city. definitely be out of supply. It can't trace. It can trace it well, can, can it trace it tr- through there? No, not through seas. Only lakes are allowed to trace through. Oh, okay. okay so there are a few yeah. lake hex sides. Like in the north, there's Lake uh, Pelpus, Lake Ladoga. Uh, okay. Those lakes are you're allowed to trace across those, but not across the Sea of Azov. Okay. Okay. So there's one more important piece to the way supply works. When you check supply, you check the phasing player first, then you check the non-phasing player. Phasing is a board gaming turn that means the player whose turn it is. So uh, let's go back in the north here around Minsk. And let's say I had a unit here and you put me out of supply with the 18th army. And first, let's say that Smolensk is not German for the purposes of this. Um, So... Uh, You put me out of supply. This northwest unit can't trace... uh, Let's say Minsk is under enemy control, obviously. um, And Riga is under enemy control. So this northwest unit can't trace to Kiev. It can't trace to Minsk. It can't trace to Riga. And it can't trace to Smolensk because it's uh, completely out of supply. Um, On my turn, we check for units... my, My units first, which are out of supply. We check this northwest unit is out of supply... I'm going to do another couple of things here to make my point. Um, Now, we put this Northwest unit out of supply, and one of the effects of being out of supply is you don't get a zone of control. So I check my supply first on my turn, because you put him out on your turn. So on my turn, we check. He's out of supply. That allows the 18th Army to trace directly around him back to Minsk. Does that make sense? And so the phasing player goes first. The phasing player checks and goes out of supply first and loses their Zoc before we check supply for the non-phasing player. So putting someone okay. out of supply on your turn can work even if it puts yourself out of supply if the thing that you put out of supply was the thing that was blocking you. Okay, that's going to take a couple iterations for me to fully grasp the how to use that appropriately, sure. but I get it. Um, so here's the effects of being out of supply. Um, You can't make your unit stronger. You can't flip it over. I should point out that most of these units have two sides. The German units all start on their stronger side. The Soviet units all start on their weaker side. Um, So if a unit takes uh, damage in combat, it flips to its weaker side. And then during the organization step, you can pay cards, essentially. You can discard cards to flip it back over to its stronger side to give it reinforcements. If it's out of supply, you can't give it reinforcements. Um... Its movement allowance is always reduced to three when it's out of supply. Um, I should talk about that real quick. You see some of your units, well, they all have two two, uh, numbers in the bottom. The left number is its combat value. The right number is its movement allowance. When you're out of supply, it doesn't matter if you're a tank army that has six movement. You only get three because you don't have the oil to go long distance. Um, It loses its zone of control. In combat, an out of supply unit uh, gives... Uh, big penalty gets big penalties when defending and the reason it gets no penalties on the attack and the reason for that is this on your turn you put me out of supply on my turn i'm going to use the last of my supplies in a last ditch effort to get out of this situation to break back into uh, my lines of communication right so even though i'm technically out of supply it doesn't affect me for combat. All the other effects still take place, but when I'm attacking, 
I'm going to use everything I got to break through because if I don't, it's game over. However, if you put yourself out of supply on your turn by accident, right? If you're not paying close enough attention, if you overstretch yourself trying to win something and another combat doesn't break your way and my unit stays in place blocking supply when it wasn't supposed to, then your unit is out of supply on your turn, on my turn, and I can attack it and it's weaker because it didn't get any supplies at the end of the last turn. That's kind of kind of how it's it, you explain it, the narrative of the way that the game works. So in combat, the only penalties are on defense. No penalties for attacking while out of supply. Um, okay. And that's just the way the, the, the phasing works. Okay. Certain events only supply uh, work for supplied forces. So if, uh, if an event says, choose a supplied unit and double its attack value for this battle or what have you, obviously it doesn't work when you're out of supply. And at the end, you're removed. So those are the effects. No Zoc. Movement is reduced to three at the most. In combat, you take penalties on the defense, and you can't get stronger, and your cards can't make you stronger most of the time. Okay, so that's supply. Um, there are a few other effects of zone of control. Um, so let's talk about those as part of uh, movement. We'll get to that in a second. So that's the most complex part of the game, is the supply and zone of control things. We're basically done. We're about to start. Um, so... After we do the supply check, I'm pulling back up the uh, the, the the sequence of play. After um, the supply can, check, can you pause one? Sure. Um, sequence of play six removals. If you out of supply yourself, would you be removed on the enemy's turn? Uh, step six turn. Yes. So if uh, say on your so turn, so like if you out of supply yourself before on... you even get a chance. Like, if you out of supply yourself at the end of your turn, before your turn even restarts, your, your guys will basically be dead unless yeah, the enemy yeah. screws up. Don't put yourself out of supply on your own turn. It's very bad. Okay. When you, end, when you do your movements, you want to do them in such a way that your guys are going to be in supply at the end of your turn. Now, that can happen because you might gamble and say, listen, I'm going to put this guy here, and if this battle breaks my way, then he'll be in supply. If it doesn't, he's screwed. Right, but you're counting, you're throwing everything into it. I've got a big advantage here. I'm gonna play a card. But sometimes the dice still kills you. So those are risks you have to consider. Is it worth okay. risking this? That's part of the game. All right. Okay. So normal turn. Card phase, supply check. Then the organization step. It's very simple. First, you would discard two cards to flip your unit back to its stronger side if it's taken damage. Then you would place any new reinforcements that you got from the turn track in a friendly uh, home city. So for you, that would be a city in greater Germany. If you are getting units that are being rebuilt after being destroyed in combat, they can come back in a city in greater Germany or in a city that you have captured, I believe, in, uh, the, in Soviet Russia. Actually, that might be just a shattered units. Um, but we'll, we'll go through that as, as we need to. Um, then the reorganization step, we'll talk about that when we need to. It's not, not really difficult. Okay, now we're talking about movement. So on your movement, your units get movement points equal to that second number. You can see the Germans have way better movement than us at the beginning of the game. All their armor units have uh, six. Let's talk about that real quick. So uh, this unit in, here at Kiev, uh, that has a, that's an armor unit. It's that oval. That's the NATO symbol for armor. Tanks. Um, the X is a symbol for infantry. And you might also see this that has an X and an oval. That is a mechanized uh, infantry. So that's like halfway between infantry and armor. They've got uh, trucks and some, some, some tracked vehicles that can help them move quickly most of the time. They also usually have armor defense, like anti-tank weaponry. Um, whereas the infantry armies typically didn't have as much in terms of anti-tank weaponry. They had some, but not as not on the same scale as actual armor units or actual um, mechanized units. Um, and that's those are the three types of units that you can see here, and those are the only three types that are going to matter for all intents and purposes. Sorry, there's a couple more. I think if we flip this guy over... No, this guy? One of these guys is a shock unit. There it is. The little dot in the middle means he's a shock unit. He gets a bonus when he's attacking always. But you're not going to see he? him for a while. 
This uh, I'll flip him back over. Okay. Yep. All right. So, control F. There we go. So for movement, uh, let me move all these guys out of the way. Let's ignore zone of control for a moment and pull up the terrain effects chart. That is the chart that is right next to the red die on the top of the screen. Yep, I have it open on my second monitor. Okay, so you can see it's got each of the different types of terrain. It looks more complicated than it is because it also shows the weather effects. But every time we go into a new weather, I'll reiterate what's different about it. We're going to start in clear weather, which means the weather has no effect on movement. Then we're probably going to go into mud, then we'll go into snow, and you'll learn how they, they affect movement. But let's start just... Normal moving through open ter terrain and cities, it's one for every kind of unit. Uh, a forest is still one for infantry units, but it's two for armor. You see the different columns there? Mm -hmm. All right. Marsh is particularly bad for armor, and it's still pretty... It, that's the first time that infantry really feel the burn. So marsh, mountains, and the straits, infantry has to pay two to get through. But otherwise, infantry pretty much moves freely through forest and cities and normal terrain for one point each. So, for as an example, uh, the second panzer here could go one, two, three, four, five, six. They could even, uh, instead of going that way, they could have gone this way. Uh, from here, they could go four, five, six. Because going through cities, they don't have to stop. Uh, they don't have to pass go. They don't have to collect $200. But if they went through the marsh, it would be like four. And then to go into the forest, it would be two. So you can see how much slower they travel over poor terrain. Rivers are ignored as far as movement is concerned because moving across a river when there's no enemy to defend the other side is fairly easy. If there's no easy bridges, you bring up a bridging crew, you build a bridge, and everybody crosses. But if there's an enemy on the other side, it's much harder, which means when you're attacking across a river, the defender gets a, penalty, uh, gets a bonus, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So um, that's simple movement, and of course the infantry army could ignore this, the forest and just go one, two, three. Uh, that's how that works. Now... Um, let's talk about zones of control. So let's say there is a Soviet unit there. It's projecting a zone of control into each of these hexes around it, right? We talked about that. The zone of control not only stops supplies, but if one of your units ever moves into it, it must immediately stop. Cannot keep going. If a unit starts in an enemy zone of control, it can move out of its zone of control as long as it doesn't move directly into another hex from that same unit. So this is an illegal move. That's called infiltration movement. It's not allowed. The zone of control will block it. If this okay. unit were out of supply, it would have no zone of control. That's the wrong thing. And, and then you could do that. But this is never a legal move. However, uh, you could do this and then that. That is a legal move. Does that make sense? Yes. The only other thing to know is when you're moving out of an enemy zone of control, it costs plus one to whatever the normal movement cost would be. So if you were going from here to there, instead of costing one, it would cost two. If you're going from here to here, instead of costing one, it would cost two. If this was an armor unit going from here to here, instead of costing two, it would cost three. Does that all make sense? Yep. Okay. And last thing, it, it you always base the cost on what you're moving into, not moving out of? Correct. Now, okay. one other thing. Uh, this, actually, that's not it. This is what I want to say. This is a legal move, because even though you're moving from one zone of control to another, they're different units. It's only moving along a single unit zone of control that that is prohibited. Um, again, moving so... from here to here would make you immediately stop. Oops, I dragged it way over there. Um, would make you immediately stop because you entered a zone of control. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think, is there some way to, like... Yes, you've just frozen that unit in place. He can't get out. Okay. He can't leave. He can't get supplies. He could, however, get out if we do this. Units are allowed... A zone of control essentially um, is blocked... Is turned off. ...by a friendly yeah. unit, Yeah. So the way that that works, though, is it still has to stop when it enters... I'm sorry, that's still, I believe, units cannot move directly from one hex unless the hex being entered is also a friendly unit. Uh, so yes, you could do this. He must immediately stop when he does that. So he's breaking the normal zone of control rules, but he still has to stop when he enters that hex. Um, okay. 
In addition to allowing some limited infiltration movement, the presence of a friendly unit negates an enemy controlled hex for the purpose of tracing supply path or when retreating. So this unit could also retreat through the friendly unit as needed from combat. Because when you re when you lose combat, you typically have to retreat. And if you can't retreat because of the zones of control, like if this unit loses combat and it can't retreat, then it just takes step losses instead. Um, okay. Exiting. That's it. That's zone of control. Um, okay. So that is probably the last most complex piece on here. Now we're just going to start and continue learning as we play. Combat and everything is great. Because what the game does, I'm just going to reload the starting scenario here. Um, and I'm going to choose Soviet. The game sets up the very beginning where we start, essentially, in the German movement and combat phase. And you are Do forced, I need to do anything? Uh, yeah, right-click on me again and choose Synchronize. Um, the, the German player, basically, because of the way that the scenario is set up, you have to attack specific units. There's no choice. Uh, in your first turn. So that lets us uh, go through what the combat looks like without you having to make any decisions. You can just see how it plays out. Well, you might have to make some with the cards. All right. So um, let us go ahead and start. You're going to play the Germans again, this, the Axis, because the Axis start out way stronger. <laughs> it's way harder to, to defend well as the, uh, as, the, as the Soviets if you don't know how the game systems fit together. So... Um, your units, by the way, have a stacking limit of two. You can stack up two units together. Uh, so this is in, in illegal. And at the end of each individual phase, we check to see if stacking is broken. And then you'll have to destroy one of your units if you did that. So okay. your stacking limit is two. My stacking limit is one. My units can't even stack with each other because your units represent armies. Mine represent army groups. Mine represent an order of magnitude more men and they still suck. So there's that. <laughs> okay, so you literally, like, the whole thing where, like, army can retreat through another army or whatever, can't do that. No, they can. They'll just have to then die. <laughs> They'll just die in supply instead of dying out of supply <laughs> is really the advantage where that comes into play. All right. So you're going to start by drawing six cards because that's your German surprise attack. Normally, you would discard two of them as a handicap as your first game. I'm going to let you keep all six. Is... Well, we don't, we don't have to do that. What do you mean? I mean, like, we can play it legit. <laughs> if you want. It's up to you. Yeah let's, yeah, let's do that. I just need to remember how these buttons work again. And I get zero cards, by the way, because it's a... Uh, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're not ready for this is what it comes down to. Okay, um, which one was the deck again? Axis button? Hand, it's at the top there next to card decks and Soviet okay, Hand. Okay, cool. Is there any reason, well, I'll turn on yours whenever I need to. All right, so six, I, I get six and then I have to discard two down to two, right? So if there's any with stars on them, you can immediately discard those because they won't work for the next 11 turns. And then you get to keep the rest, even if they do have stars on them, because you might want to use them uh, for oh, discards. Oh, wait, don't I have to discard down to two? No, sorry, you discard two, not down to two. On oh, the first okay, turn, okay. you draw six and discard two. Okay. Well, that worked out. I had two stars. Um, okay. So, then... The, uh, the first turn restrictions. These are restrictions just for the first turn. You see that the units have a little uh, letter to the left of their icon. N, C, mm -hmm. S, north, center, and south is what those are. So the north units can only attack that northwest guy. The C units can only attack the west guy. And the south units can only attack the southwest guy. That's the predetermined strategy that the Germans were going to launch at the beginning. And that's what you're stuck with on the first turn. The Romanian units in the south, as well as the 11th Army, um, cannot move on the first turn. Nor can they advance after combat and like chase the south unit should they force it to retreat. So those are the first turn restrictions. Uh, the other thing, it is clear weather. You get three blitz markers. Basically, each blitz marker can be used in one combat to give you a bonus. Um, and the thing to consider is that uh, there are a couple of effects happening at the start of the game. Uh, rail disruption during turns one and two. You can't use rail movement. And we didn't talk about rail movement, so uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that. Hey, Arctics. What's up, guys? Not there much. Am I interrupting? 
No, you watching the stream? Uh, I didn't know you were okay. Now I know your stream. That's fine. <laughs> There you go. We're we're um, uh, I'm teaching him how to play a board game called No Retreat: The Russian Front. You couldn't tell by the title of the channel. I saw the title. I didn't know <laughs> what was going on. All right, it's a whole bunch go. of craziness. Okay, so also you don't get any replacements for the first four turns because Hitler and the German High Command were not prepared. They thought it was going to be like another France. Like, oh, it'll just take a summer. We'll knock them out. We knocked out France in a month. They were the biggest and best military in the world. We can knock out the stupid Soviets in a, in a summer. So you don't get any reinforcements. You're not allowed to flip your units back over to their stronger side uh, should they take damage. They probably won't. Um, <laughs> so we can go ahead and play now. Um, okay. So, so I'm going to read these cards. Read the cards. Um, see if there are any that have any effects on battle. Uh, those would be uh, useful. You could use those. Some of them might say you can ignore a river crossing penalty, for example. That's a useful one. Um, and then uh, we'll get ready to go here. What is counter blow? That is something I will explain to you when we go through combat here in a second. It's not going to apply okay. on your turn. Counter blows only apl apply on my turn, basically. Just let me know when you're ready with the cards. Oh, thank you for the for the host, Arctic. <laughs> I've never oh, had oh. anybody host me before. Now I feel I mean, like there, a, a movie star. I could throw I could throw a thousand people in here if you want. <laughs> I'm not sure a thousand people would be interested. <laughs> I love these board games. I know that I am one of the uh, you know two percent of the population that really likes these kind of games. So, I I was trying to get your attention like a couple months ago. There's an interesting statistic now that I'm kind of in on all these things. Um, most popular streamer on Twitch followed Tales of Tear. Really? Yep. His name is Lyric. Lyric. Most popular streamer on Twitch. Yeah. When he streams, forty thousand people watch his stream. What does like he stream? It was just all kinds of random Everything? stuff. Everything. Tons like, of stuff. Late, lately, he's been doing the whole indie game thing. But uh, I was I was talking to him and I looked through his follower log. Like I have I have back end tools for for Twitch. And uh, one of his first follows when he joined Twitch was Tales of Tyria. Wow. Yep. That's cool. Yep. I love that show. That was that was that was a fun show. All right, Ruach, oh, you ready? So I'm counting. I'm seeing what I feel like I should do. Okay. Well, I can tell you what you have to do on your first turn. Basically, you do that, and then you do this, and then you do this. The order in which you do this doesn't really matter. Where you move doesn't really matter. I've played this basically at the very beginning all the time. Doesn't matter. Those units have to attack those units, and after attacking, they get to move. So you'll get to make decisions after the combat takes place, basically. Oh, and that unit has to go there. Um, so, that's your movement phase. No, no other way what, about what? it. Oh, the scenario, no, the scenario says in the first turn, all the S units have to attack the Southwest. All the C units have to attack this guy. Okay. All the N. This is only the first turn. You're you're locked into this, um, okay. and it, it's well, helpful then. because it makes it easier to teach. I think. Okay. Um. It, let's. That fine. Bert works for okay. me. Okay. So we. Um, so now. Now I have one that gives me, I think, a benefit on attack. Okay. Card. So. Now let's let's go through the attacking procedure. So we're done with movement. We go to combat. And on combat, you're going to choose declare all voluntary attacks. So you're going to declare all the attacks that you would like to make. After you're done declaring all your voluntary attacks, I would declare all counter blows, which are sometimes known as involuntary attacks. And I'll discuss that later for now. Right click on the units you want to attack and choose, uh, what's the option there? Uh, target marker. You can also click them and choose Alt-1. Nope. Uh, you want to put the targets on my units. So these are your targets, not uh, the units that are going to attack. There you go. And then the one more in the south. All right. Now, for the purposes of the explanation, I'm just going to move the unit out of Moscow. I'll move them right back in a second. If this unit was here, and I had cards in my hand, after you were done placing all your voluntary attacks... I could place a counter blow marker on this unit. And the reason I might do that is to pull the 16th army off of the attack to the north. What the counter blow means is you must attack this unit with one of your units. It's your choice. If you had, for example, these units stacked up like this, you would get to choose which one attacked 
the reserve army with the counter blow marker, but one of them has to attack that counter blow. You also must attack all the places that you declared an attack on. What the counter blow represents is a spoiling attack. I know that you're going to attack me up there, and I'm trying to draw your attention away and force you to spend resources over here. It costs me a card, and I also give up any terrain benefits that I would have gotten from defending in this hex, because instead I'm kind of, this is like a mini counterattack. So normally I would get a river crossing defense bonus from you attacking across that river, but because it's a counter blow, I'm giving it up. So the cost is one card and I'm giving up all terrain benefits as the defender. So that's what counter blows are and that's what they're for. And some cards will give you the ability to place counter blows um, instead of paying one card and one counter blow, you can you can play a card that gives you two counter blows, for example. Right now, though, there's no counter blows for me to make because you are attacking every unit that's adjacent to one of your units. So there's no counter blows, so we can just continue. Does that all make sense, though? Yep. Okay. So we can go from top to bottom and take a look at how we do this. So I'm going to just delete these as we go so we can see the units in play here. So the way that we first do this, let me pull up the sequence of play so everybody can see in the home game. Um, we have uh, declare all voluntary attacks followed by all counter blows and now we resolve them. First we check the strength of each side. My strength is 3. That was really easy to calculate. Uh, yours is 11. And 11 to 3 is a 3 to 1 advantage if we round down. If you had had 12 then it would have been a 4 to 1 advantage. Right? Okay. Yeah. So um, we look on the Axis Combat Results table, and you can pull that up by clicking on the Show Combat and SOP Charts button at the yep. top. Um, and so we are in the three to one column. Now, after we check the raw strength, we check to see if there are any column shifts for attacker and defender. If I was defending in the forest, I would get a defense shift. So instead of, defend, instead of uh, the three to one column, we'd be fighting on the two to one column, for example. However, I'm not in the forest, and even though one of your units is attacking across the river, in order for me to get the river bonus, all of your units have to be attacking across the river. So because some of your units are on the other side of the river, I don't get any defensive bonus. Instead, you get an attacking bonus for attacking an infantry unit in clear terrain in clear weather with armor. So that's an armor bonus. The panzers there give you that bonus. So you shift instead of three to one, you're getting a four to one column is what we're resolving this on. And as you can see, the farther to the right you go, the better the results get. And we'll discuss the results as they happen. Um, so okay. that armor bonus comes when you're attacking infantry in the open terrain in clear weather. If those okay. conditions are Where not satisfied. Can I, is that in the terrain effect one? Uh, yes, or that is in the terrain effects to... chart. Yep, if we pull that up and drag it over, you can see the little uh, thing next to movement. It has a picture of an armor and then a one and an arrow, question mm -hmm. mark. That's saying, do you get the armor bonus in this case? The armor shift bonus, The armor okay. shift bonus. Open terrain, yes. Everything else, no, 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 no. River sex hex side, yes. You get the armor bonus even if you're attacking across a river. Um, and then... Uh, only in clear terrain. You can see that everything else, you have to meet all three of those criteria in order to uh, for it to work. Armor in the open against infantry. So that's where it's important to point out mechanized infantry, you don't get the armor bonus against. Lucky for you, okay. none of my units are mechanized infantry on this front line. So you get the armor bonus against everybody. Uh, yeah. Okay. So... We're on the three to one table because of the raw strength. Then you get an armor bonus for it becomes four to one. Do you have any battle cards that might give you a bonus? Sometimes like the Luftwaffe card um, says gives you a shift in no. battle. Well, I, I do, but I'm, I'm not using it on this particular attack. Okay. Now, another thing to consider at the top of the screen in the unused markers holding box, there are three blitz markers. You get three blitz markers because on the turn track, it says on this turn, the German player gets three blitz markers. The blitz markers represent artillery and air support uh, that you get to uh, essentially put wherever you want. Each blitz marker represents enough support for one battle, and each marker gives you one shift. And you can't use more than one in a single battle. So you're basically going to okay. choose three battles so, where these are going to um, get support. So I get three this round, and then even if I don't, I'm guessing it just returns up to three, I don't get Correct. three additional? you don't get to save them from round to round. Oh, well, then I'm going to use one. 
Okay. So if we use that in this chart, now we're looking at the five to one like column. And then you roll. Uh, yeah, I think what the best way to do it is leave it up here and just um, we'll put it uh, over to the left when you've used them. And then we'll drag it back for next turn. Okay. All right. So now go ahead and roll a die. And we're rolling on the five to one column. And you got the best... Nope, that's actually the worst possible result. But it's still a Defender Retreats. So a DR is Defender Retreats. I must retreat two steps. And that is it. And you can look at the, the thing says, Defender Retreats, Defender Retreats two hexes. Attacking units may advance if the target hex is vacated. Now, um, you are allowed to advance after combat. There are three levels of advance after combat. You can always, always advance into the hex where the battle took place. So all your units could do that. If you did with all your units, though, you'd kind of overstack. Non-armor units can then move an extra hex in uh, clear weather uh, and in snow weather. And I'll pull this back up so we can see. The far right column says stops advance. So advance after combat, like okay. I said, you can okay. always go into the target's hex no matter what, period. So your units can always go in there. If you chose to move again, infantry get one more move. So let's say he goes there. I'm going to let you do this in a second, but I'm just chewing this for an example. Okay. Um, armor units get to go into the hex, always, like normal, and then they get to move two hexes uh, if they wanted to. Or you could do you know that and then that to try to surround me. Now, during this advance after combat, you ignore zones of control. Because basically, the unit, that, the unit that retreated was supposed to be guarding these guys, and they are able to take advantage of the fact that there was nobody guarding this back area. Um, so you ignore zones of control, not only from the unit that you defeated, but any other of my units, because they assumed that these guys had this under control. They don't have units blocking in these zones of control. So, then your other infantry could do that. Um, so that's one option for you at this moment. Now, the things that will stop advance after combat. Uh, let's go back a second. Uh, like I said, units can always go into the defending hex, no matter what the terrain is, no matter what the weather is. However, if you then moved so into a forest hex, forest will stop advance after combat. So even though the panzer normally gets to go three, if you move into a forest hex, it becomes one. Which means when I defend, if I defend in a forest hex, it will prevent you from getting more than one advance after combat. If I defend in the open, your panzers get to keep, yee, we get to keep running in the open because there's no forest here. Um, cities sense. will not stop advance after combat. Forest, marsh, mountain, straits will all stop advance after combat. Objective hex sides will stop advance after combat. Um, if a unit is unsupplied, it does not get multi-hex advance after combat. Uh, in mud weather, no units get multi-hex advance after combat. They can only go into the defending hex and then must stop. In snow weather, uh, all units can get the two hex, but the armor unit doesn't get its third hex. In a long winter, there's no advance after combat, just like mud. So that sounds like a lot, but you only have to care about it on each individual turn Okay, this turn, you got clear weather, your armor goes three, your infantry go two. That's all you need to know. So go ahead and move your units as you would like. You could go to try to hit that unit in Riga, because that's, that's a victory point location. You definitely want to take advantage of that as uh, soon as possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I'll do that. Okay, perfect. So let's move on to the next combat. So this one is going to be even more in your favor, if I recall. I've got three I'm defending. Using a blitz. Well, let's count up the raw numbers here. You've got 10, 17, 21 to 4. So you are on the 5 to 1 column. However, you are armor attacking infantry in the open. So you're already on the 6 to 1 column. You don't even wow. need to use a blitz. <laughs> I have, don't have defensive terrain. I don't have any cards that can work in my favor. You don't even need to use the blitz. So go ahead and roll okay. a die on the 6 to 1 column. You're just overwhelming force right here because you got two Panzer armies. Destroyed. A 5. That's the best result you could have hoped for. So destroyed means I drag it to the destroyed units box. And the destroyed units box, I have to pay one card to get it back. 
If it had okay. been shattered, it goes to the shattered unit box and I get it back for free next turn. But obviously, if you go and capture Minsk right now, I can't put it in Minsk because you're going to be sitting in Minsk. So that's the difference between a shattered unit uh, and a retreated unit. So a retreated unit would have done this and blocked you. A shattered unit would go out and come back, but it's out of your way for this whole turn. So now okay. you are able to advance, and your first advance has to be into this hex, and from there your armor units can move two, and your infantry units can move one. That makes good sense to me. Um, how do I split these again? Double click, and then uh, click individual ones. Click off of them if you still have them both selected. There you go. Perfect. Now I'm going to right-click on your unit and choose Drop Control Marker, and we're going to upgrade the victory points from 12 to 13. It starts at 12 because Greater Germany has 12 victory points, including the, uh, the oil fields in the bottom. So now you have 13 okay. victory points. And we can move on to the next combat. And since you've got two more combats and two more blitzes, there's no reason not to use them both. So in this combat, uh, okay. uh, you that, have... That makes sense. 8 and 7 is 15 to 5. That puts you at 3 to 1. Uh, however, you are armor against infantry in the open and clear terrain. Uh, so that brings you up to 4 to 1. You're using a blitz. That brings you to 5 to 1. Uh, is there a combat card you wish to play? Uh, I think I'm all set. Okay. Roll a die on the 5 to 1 column. A 6. That is defender destroyed again. So this guy's in the destroyed unit box. Actually, the other guy was in the destroyed unit box, too. There we go. And now you may advance after combat into the vacated hex. And your armor can move two, and your infantry can move one. Perfect. And now we go down to the Romanian one. And this is a six to three, so that is a two to one. And uh, unfortunately, you're attacking across the river, so I do get a shift for that, and you don't have any armor. So... Uh, I, I don't, you don't get a shift for that. However, you will get a shift for the Blitz. So it goes from 2 to 1, back for the river, and then back up for the Blitz. Did you have any cards that you wanted to use? Yeah, I'm going to be playing a Luftwaffe support. Okay. So right-click on it and choose Play, and that'll put it in the discard pile, and it'll sell it. So there you go. So that gives you one column shift, um, or play during the removal phase to not remove an... Un oh, because they get air supply. Gotcha. All right, so... It goes from 2 to 1 to 3 to 2 because of the river, then back up to 2 to 1 because of the blitz, then up to 3 to 1 because you've got the Luftwaffe, extra Luftwaffe support. So go ahead and roll on the 3 to 1 column. A 3. Defender retreats. That is probably the, not, not, uh, not bad, actually. Could have been better, but not bad. All right. 3 to 1 is really what you want. If you're going to make an attack, you should try and make sure it's at least at 3 to 1 after all blitzes and things are com com compared in there. Now, first turn limitation only, our units cannot move or advance after combat, so that's done. They can't go anywhere. Okay. All right. And that will pull up this sequence of play here. That is the end of combat. We would recheck supply, but there was nobody out of supply at the beginning, so we don't have to worry about that. We do detraining. Uh, which doesn't matter because nobody was put on a train to go somewhere else. So now it's the Soviet player turn. On my turn, I draw some cards. I'm going to bring them over to put them in sight for the viewing pleasure of the chat. There we go. So now I'm looking at these cards, and I've got one that actually affects me at all. Uh, huh. And it's kind of okay, but let's see what we can do here. So I've got two units that were destroyed. And I have to consider how I'm going to use them. But let's follow this sequence of play as I'm going through here. So I drew my cards. We do a supply check. Right now, everybody should be in supply. My south unit has supply from Odessa and from the, the sea if it needed to. It's fine. The central unit can actually trace into Kiev. And then Kiev can trace back. Your zones of control don't block supply in the city itself if the city is enemy controlled. It's assumed to have a small garrison, right? Um, mm -hmm. Your units are being supplied in Minsk because you took it over. The 1st Army and the 4th Panzer in the north are being supplied from Konigsberg. They can draw supply paths right back there because you're blocking the zone of control from the northwest from uh, preventing it. So everybody's in supply, so we can move on. Keep pulling up the wrong one. Uh, all right, now we've got uh, the organization step. I can't flip my units over. That's not how they work because <laughs> they suck right now. Eventually, I'll get to flip them over. Uh, the turn track will tell us when. Uh, so now we go to the placement step. 
I don't have any reinforcements, but I can bring these destroyed units back onto the field, and they can enter the map on, I believe, any uh, Soviet city that's under my control, even if it's in your zone of control. Soviet units are placed in any Soviet-controlled city that can trace a supplies path, even in enemy Zox or on any east or south map edge uh, hex in Russia, not in an enemy zone of control. In addition, recovering shattered units may be placed in any Soviet-controlled city inside Greater Germany, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I am going to place my five here in mm, Smolensk. And when I place it there, it's coming uh, off as a destroyed unit, I have to place a, disor a disorganized marker on it. That marker means I'm not allowed to attack with this unit this turn. Then I'm going to take this west unit and I think I'm going to put it in Kalinin, north of Moscow. And it also gets a disorganized marker on it. Alt 3 apparently is the number for that. Now, I get to move on to my uh, movement. Oh, sorry. The reorganization step is I can remove those disorganized markers by discarding a card. However, I have no intention of attacking your super strong units right now. I'm going to stay and defend where I have some kind of advantage. Uh, so instead, I'm just going to leave those markers there. And I will then move my units because we're on the movement step now and my units get to move whatever their movement is my leningrad unit is going to move one let's see is that where i want it to be i think that's where i want it to be yeah so my leningrad move unit moved out of leningrad a little bit uh my unit up there in the north he's stuck smolensk is going to stay where he is but the moscow one is going to go one two three uh this unit's going to go one two three in the middle the central unit's going to go come back, try to hold Kiev, of course. And that's it. I don't want to move anybody else. So that's a quick move phase. He's, they're done. Now we go to combat. I have no combats I wish to declare at this time. You may, if you wanted to, place counter blow markers. Um, if you did, I don't see a place where I would recommend it. What you would want to do, let's say, I'm just going to move your guys here. Uh, but you. Um, if you had this stack, that's a very strong stack of 13. Uh, you could put a counter blow marker on yourself, basically force a fight between my weak guy and your strong guy. And if we look how that would turn out is you've got 13 to three, uh, I've got three to 13, uh, by the way, uh, which is actually less than one to three, which is an automatic counterattack. So by putting a counter blow and forcing me to attack you, you get an attack on me automatically. It would cost you a card. Um, or if it wasn't quite, let's say it was just barely one to three, you can see that on the Soviet combat results table, two thirds chance you get a counter attack against me. So that's the reason that you might want to put a counter blow. If you, even if I'm not attacking you, if you have strong units next to my weak units, you might want to put a counter blow and force a fight. I'm moving these guys back to where they were. Um, but... I don't think you have a reason to place a counter blow right now. None of what the units... What about in the northwest? Um, you could put two counter blows to force me to attack all all three of those guys. It would cost you two cards um, or a card that gives that. you two. Okay. Ah, the Stavka. Is that what that is? Yeah. Or Manstein. You may declare up to two counter blows. There you go. Um, okay, so you put... Counter blow marker. On. Oops, I put an extra one. All right, and these are. Let's see. You have the stack that is six and five is eleven. So three to eleven is less than three to one, right? So it's an automatic counterattack for you, if I'm not mistaken. There, or, sorry, less than one to three, because uh, three to nine would have been one to three, but it's worse than that. So you get an automatic counterattack at the same odds, and I don't get defensive bonuses because I'm attacking you. So the city doesn't help me, unfortunately. So uh, you can now uh, go ahead and roll? and roll. So this would be uh, three to one, basically. Uh, if you have any don't cards, you roll? Um, yes, you're right. I roll on. Uh, no, sorry. I don't roll on my table because the odds are so bad, they're worse than one to three. So it's an automatic result of a counterattack. I don't have to roll. I, I got a counterattack result. The counterattack result is the defender may launch an immediate counterattack, recompute the odds, no terrain modifiers. 
So that's the, that's okay. the stage we're at. So you are 11 to 3, which is 3 to 1. So you're attacking me at the 3 to 1 on a counterattack, basically. Um, and you can't use blitzes, and you could use cards, but you rolled a 1. That's interesting. Which is a CB. Yeah, that's a counter blow. What that means is the battle was kind of inconclusive. Um, so you put a counter blow marker on one of your units that participated in this attack. And if I am still next to that unit on my next turn, or sorry, you attacked me. So I have to put a counter, sorry, the flip the target marker on its counter blow side. So I have to put the target marker here. So this means if you're still next to me on your turn, uh, you have to attack me, but I give up my terrain benefits. So this is really good for you because uh, you now I don't get the shift for the city. It's not actually it's not good for you because a defender retreats or, or destroyed would have been the best, but this is still not bad. It makes it so that your next attack on your next turn is going to be easier for all intents and purposes. It's essentially a continuation of the same battle the next the next turn. If you choose to stay, you could leave if you wanted to, uh, and I would be okay with that. Um, anyway. So that is the only one that the only fight that takes place this turn. So then we go to the rest uh, removals, detraining, end of the Soviet player turn. We go to the next turn. So that's it. You played a whole turn. Does that make yes. sense? Yes, it did. All right. Do you want to keep going? Yes. All right. So you are going to get one reinforcement. I'm going to drag it over to the un unused box where all your blitzes are, and I get two reinforcements. I'm going to drag them sort of uh, off the map on my side here. And uh, the turn marker advances. Now, it's still reminding us we have limited rail moves, so you can't use rail movement, uh, and I can't use any extra rail movement. It's also still clear weather, and you still get three blitz markers. So that's what it's telling us about this turn. Next turn, okay. it's going to be mud, and that means your units are not going to move very fast, and it means that uh, attacking is going to be harder, essentially, uh, because of that. It's going to stop your advance after combat, things like that. Actually, attacking isn't really affected. Um, it just means you can't move as fast. All right. So uh, now we go to the beginning of your turn. Discard down to two. You already have two. And draw four. Mm -hmm. Now keep an eye on the top half. Sometimes these cards will say, play this card immediately upon receiving it. You don't have a choice. You have to play those cards. Some of them will be like uh, cards that change the weather. Some of them will be cards that reshuffle the deck and discard pile together. Okay, so this is what I got. Uh, fierce. Play this card immediately. Oh, fickle then. weather. Yeah. Ooh, that's really good for you. If this turn... Oh, if this turn... Nope. Okay. So there is variable weather, and I will pull it out here. If you look at the bottom of... Actually, if you hover over the stack on the next turn, on turn three, it'll show you all four units that are stacked up there. You can see there's a variable weather marker there that starts as mud. If this were that turn, you would get to turn that to clear. That would have been really good for you. But unfortunately, variable weather is only in uh, the September, October, November, December, and January, February, and I think March, April also has variable weather. But the two summer months are just summer. There's no variable weather okay. for those. So uh, that does that say draw a new card to replace this existing yes. one? Okay, go ahead and draw a new card. All right, now I have to discard down to two? Nope, nope. You discard it oh, down to four. two before you drew your four. Okay, okay. And you already had two, so you're fine. Okay. All right. So now we continue on and we go to your supply check. I think everybody's still in supply. Nothing really changed. So we yeah, go to changed. the organization step. You can't flip. There's nothing to flip. So we go to your placement step. That new unit that you've got, the second army right up here, it's in the Baltic Sea. Uh, you may mm -hmm. place that in any city in greater Germany. So Konigsberg, if you want the extra help in the north, maybe Lublin if, or Bucharest, if you want the help in the south. Okay. Uh, and because it's a reinforcement, it does not get a disorganized marker. Uh, if it had come off of the destroyed box or the shattered box, it would have gotten a, a, a disorganized marker, but it's a brand new unit, never before seen combat. All right. Now we go to the movement phase and you may start your movement. Ooh, cut them I off. Wanted, I wanted to... Uh, did I want to do that? No, I wanted well, to not. Well, now... I, no, I did. I do want to do that. Now, I, if my guy has to retreat, he can retreat this way. Because you're not blocking him with a zone of control on that side. Yeah, so I don't want to do that. I want you want to, to leave at least one guy, like, here, 
that's going to block him from retreating so that any result right now, when you attack him, any result uh, that his defender retreats or better is going to get him killed. Okay, I will... Okay, I'll do that. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, hmm. Can the R guys move now? The R guys may move now, yes. Remember, the guy that's in Odessa is going to be perpetually in supply from the sea. So unfortunately, you can't cut him off from supply, uh, but you can still, you know, fight him. And unfortunately, your Romanians are just not useful. It's like two. Okay, I'll take this two. Thank you, Romanians. They're helpful to kind of guard supply lines, but if you depend on them to guard supply lines, they're going to let you down. <laughs> so they're useful, really, as boosts to your German forces to stack on top of Germans and help. Uh, now, that last move was illegal because you went uh, uh, right, across right. my zone of control. You can still get there. You just couldn't do it that way. You'd have that exactly. Yep. So that's good because even though you can't cut me off from supply, now he can't retreat. And that means that any result is going to kill him. Any good result is going to kill him. So it's still good to block him off there. Because every guy you destroy, I'm probably going to bring on, but it's going to cost me a card every time. And bleeding me a cards is a good thing. If you can get three or four guys in the destroyed unit box on a turn, it means that I'm going to have a hard time bringing them back on fast. I'm going to have to either give up some good cards to do it or, uh, or, or leave some guys in the destroyed box. All right. All right, perfect. So it looks like you've moved all your guys. Everyone who I'm going to move. All now right. I declare. Now you're up declare. to the uh, declare all voluntary attacks. You don't have to declare the one on Riga because there's already a counter blow marker there. <laughs> all right, good. Because I was like trying to right click on like delete. No, I don't want to delete. <laughs> Yeah, these were pretty obvious. There's no option for me to place counter blows, so we can flip, skip that step because I don't have any units close enough to help my um, poor guys. Before we go too much further, I want to read a couple things. Read a couple of things. Hey, uh, for my cards, I didn't get a chance to read them all. Oh, the cards. Okay. Usually, the cards are fairly self-explanatory. It'll say, "In this phase, do that." The chat room got quiet. <laughs> I don't know how many people are still watching and being like, wow, this is this is really action-packed. This is just like Company of Heroes. <laughs> okay. One second, I'm going to uh, the door. Because it's hot in here. All right, there we go. All right, we're ready to move on to the combat phase yes all right so which one would you like to start with we'll start with the top one okay uh this is let's see another three to one i think right it's five and six that's eleven to three yep three to one and, and uh, i will blitz with it okay that makes it four to one i don't get any defensive bonuses because it's that uh continuation of the previous battle so we're on four to one and go ahead and roll all right, that is a three. That is a defender retreats. Because he can't retreat, he has to be destroyed. Yep. All right. There's no button to send to destroyed box. That would have been nice. There we go. Um, now, I'm going to move your blitz off the map there. Now, now uh, you may... Do I move at this point, or do I wait for the all combat nope, to resolve? you move at this point. So your, your armor can move three, and they have to move into Riga first. So move into Riga, drop a control marker, and I'll raise your VP marker up to 14. And then your infantry get to move one more beyond that hex, and your armor gets to move two more beyond the Riga hex. I probably should do it this way. No, I saw what you did. It's fine. I got you. Okay. You know what I don't get? Why is control Z not undo? How is that not a shortcut for the undo button? <laughs> Blows my mind. 
This program is like so great in some situations, but it's so terrible in other situations. It's just you're asking yourself why. Why does this exist the way that it exists? All right, so that was that combat. Next up. Mm-hmm. Oh, this fight doesn't look good. Uh, so you've got six and seven. That's 13. That's the 21 stack. Yeah, 21 to three. To three. However, That's better than six to one. However, yeah, it starts at the six to one. However, I am in a forest, which drops it down one, and there's a river, which drops it down another one. All right, then in that case... So it's four to um, one right now. Before combat starts... Here's Trials, Where you want it? me to draw? I could draw on the, on the screen like with arrows and signs and be like John Madden. Now these guys over here, they're going to come around and try to get in on the ramp, but there's a river in the way. And if there's a river, that's usually, that, that's usually going to help the defender. I'm playing a card that negates the river crossing. Oh no, <laughs> that's even worse. Okay, well, I could have hoped. Uh, let's see. Oh, there used to be a way to add starboard... Oh, I can't add the... Is it Starboard? No. Skype video, web page URL. I can't... There must be plugins that I'm missing because I used to be able to do the thing where I could draw on the screen. Anyway, I need John Madden to help. Uh, so we're doing this combat right <laughs> here in the middle. I'll zoom in on the combats. Look, zoom. Ooh. There we go. It's right there. Look at these numbers. This has a cross on it. All right, so what did we do? You did. You, you blocked the river crossing, so we're back to five to yeah. one. Would you like to use a blitz here? Um... There's two no. more combats. Okay, so we're on five to one. Go ahead and roll it. A two is Defender Retreats. It would have been Damn, Defender right? Shattered if you used the Blitz. All right. I know. But uh, Defender's going to retreat one, two. Uh, and now you may advance into the Hex. However, it is a Forest Hex, so it stops advance after combat when you move into it. So keep that in mind. Don't overstack the Hex. Only two of your units will be able to move in there. There's a reason I put my guy in that forest. <laughs> okay. All right. Now we'll move on to Kiev. Oh, shit. I didn't want to do that. You wanted to leave him to block the Kiev retreat? Yeah, that's, that's what I meant to do. Okay. Because he gets free movement through forests anyway. I was, that, was what, that was my original thought process. Okay. Process, but no. So which guys okay. do you want to move the panzers in there? I'm actually going to leave them all there since the, the, the army guys can get out through the forest, no problem. The panzers are moving into clear terrain, so it's no problem. Okay, so let's go to Kiev. So I've got a 5 in there. I put a strong guy. And you've got 13. So 13 to 5 is 2 to 1. With blitz. With a blitz is 3 to 1. However, I'm in a city that brings it back down to 2 to 1. So it's a tough roll. You're going to have to roll well. Show your skill. Oh, this is only good for Soviet attack. Never mind. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I should look at my hand. Is there anything here that helps me? Okay. I think, uh, I think that's the best I can do then. There kind of is something I'd that it. helps me. I might save it. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so we're on the two to one. You're rolling. <laughs> oh no! Nothing happens. That's not doing well for the Germans. I have yet to roll anything decent. No, you rolled a five once. <laughs> yeah, on like once? a six to one, <laughs> where it was like, oh great, who cares? <laughs> so we used we used two of your blitzes already, right? You didn't use a blitz there, but you used two of them already. I've used two. Yeah, I'm okay. using a blitz on this last one. Oh no! Wait a minute. We didn't use one on the Minsk fight because because it wasn't needed. It was, it was already on like five, a five to, one. to one. So you use one in Riga, and that means you got two more Kiev and Odessa. So this fight should have a blitz with it because you you don't want to just yes. leave it. So that shouldn't yeah, be two Odessa to one. Is... It should be three to one. Oh no, that was the, the blitz. You did use a blitz. It canceled out the city. That's right. That's why it was yes. on two to one. All right. So that happened. All right. Let's go to Odessa where you're using another blitz. And we've got, let's see, six, seven, eight, 
uh, 13 to 3, so that's 3 to 1. You're across the river, so that doesn't count. But I'm not across the river because I have the army on the other side of the river. No, only it, the river bonus only applies if all of your units that are attacking have to attack across a river. Oh, wait, no, no, you mean river bonus for you, river Correct. negative Correct, the, ri the river, the river okay. uh, defense bonus that's... only applies, yes. Yeah, okay, uh, that's what so, I was saying. So, uh, it is three to one, but, oh, With and the, the other thing that, I, oh, you know what? That is important. We didn't have the armor bonus in the Minsk fight because A, it was in a forest, and B, it wasn't infantry. We didn't have the armor bonus in the central because it was in a city and because it wasn't infantry. I almost forgot. That's where the other bonus would have come from, but those situations didn't have it. Okay, and there's no armor here either, but it is 3 to 1 reduced to 2 to 1 because of the city. And then you have a blitz, which brings it back up to 3 to 1. So go ahead and roll. So the armor bonus only counts if it's all armor? Like the, the second army doesn't Correct. count? Correct. The second bonus? army does not count as an armored unit. It's very clear on that in the rule book. The only okay. thing that counts as armor for that armor bonus is, uh, is the panzer or tank armies. Okay. So what am I rolling on? 3 to 1. 3 to 1. And that's including the blitz? Yep. The blitz countered out the, uh, okay. the defense bonus from the city. Oh, there you go. Defender destroyed. You got that's yes. that's tough. That unit in the south usually holds up well against the Romanians. Unfortunately, you got stonewalled in the center there. <laughs> All right. So that looks like the end of the combat phase. And Oops. so I get to move. Oh yes, I'm sorry. You get to move in there, advance after combat. So you get to capture that. That gets you a victory point. And then your infantry gets to move one more space. Actually, all the infantry is going to get to move one more space. So your second army probably shouldn't even bother moving in there because it's not going to get any further west, or east, rather. Does that make sense? Uh, you can put each of your Romanian armies on top of the Germans. I mean, is there any reason to leave these guys behind, essentially? No. There's no way for me to do any sneaky water attacks or anything like that. Okay. All right. So that's the end. We do removals Actually, and detraining. I guess couldn't wait. Couldn't technically win this be smarter? You uh, keep the same movement units together, close to the same. Maybe it's not going to matter because you're moving them individually anyway, not as a stack. And what that does is your Romanians are now fairly weak. They're only a four combat. Uh, versus if you spread the Romanians out, you've got a 7 and a 6. Uh, which means if I try to do some kind of a counterattack, which I'm not going to be able to do right now, but in the future, uh, that might be to your advantage to keep your stack strong. Okay. Okay. So, uh, that's the end of the German turn. I have to discard down, discard, discard, and draw, 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 draw. All right. So do we have any must plays? No. Play at the start of the Axis turn. That's not useful. Um, wait, 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 wait. Doesn't Central go out of supply? Uh, that will be determined on this turn right now. So give okay. it a, give it a moment. The, the, oh, only, we only check I, for removals at the end of your turn. No, no, no. I'm saying don't we recheck? Oh, okay. We will right okay. after the card phase. I'm just reading my cards. But oh, okay. uh, move up to two units from any of the shattered. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, so, okay. So I've read my cards. Now we'll do exactly what you said. Let's put units out of supply if they are out of supply. And it is true the central unit is out of supply because the city itself cannot trace back to the, uh, to the eastern thing. So I'm going to place the out of supply marker on him. So unless I can get him back in supply by the end of this turn... Uh, he is going to be giving you a victory point. Huh. Um, there's a way for me to do it, but it might allow you to get multiple of my guys out of supply. I'm not sure if that's clever or stupid. All right, uh, but let's move on. I think that's the only guy out of supply, right? Your guys are all in supply. The rest of my guys are all in supply, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we go to the organization step. Uh, the flip step doesn't happen yet. The placement step, however, does. Uh, and I think I can play a card here. 
Manpower reserves. Move up to two units from any of the shattered, destroyed, or surrender boxes to the rail movement box. So, I'm going to take the two units in the destroyed box and move them to the rail movement box. So, we can talk about the rail movement because I didn't explain that yet. Rail movement, on your turn, normally, you would be able to put one unit from anywhere on the board as long as it's in supply uh, during your movement phase. You can take it off and put it in the rail movement box. Then at the end of your turn, in the detraining section, uh, you can take it out of the rail movement box and put it in any friendly controlled city, as long as it's not breaking the stacking limits, obviously, as long as that city is in supply. Or okay. up to two hexes away from a friendly in supply city, uh, as long as you're placing it in an area that's not in an enemy zone of control. The city could be in, a, in an enemy zone of control, but as long as it's in supply. Any hex that is not an enemy controlled city, adjacent to one, or in an enemy zone of control, and can trace an overland supply path of three hexes minimum. Three hexes to a friendly supply city. So, uh, for example, uh, you could trace to Odessa and then put a reinforcement unit uh, right there, where the Romanians are. Um, you could not put it adjacent to an enemy city, but you could put it this, this spot here. Does that make sense? If it's coming so. off the train. Well, when you put guys on the train, it's basically a way of getting them from one side of the map to the other very quickly. So if you need reinforcements in the south and your north is going well, you can send some armor down to the south using by putting them on a train. And then at the end of your turn, they show up somewhere in the south near, near where you want them to be. Okay, so that manpower reserves put two of my guys from the destroyed box to the rail movement box. That's great. I only use one card to get them out. Uh, now, oh, the, these, uh, by the way, these... Uh, Markers that were on my unit should have come off at the end of my turn, last turn, because mm -hmm. that's what they do. Okay. Then we go to the movement step. Huh. Uh, well, let's see. In that case, I got these guys on the rails. I'm going to move the Leningrad fort back into Leningrad. And I guess Kalinin is going to go one... Two, three on the mountain there. Man, I'm not sure. I think these guys are going to go back and hide in the trees again. Because <laughs> it worked out so well for them. Because you rolled a one. Um, I mean, alternatively, I could send them to here to get my guys back in supply. But I feel like then you could just trap these guys out of supply. And then I'd be giving you two victory points. So I think putting them up there instead is, is the best option. Um, and I think I don't want anybody else anywhere. Oh, except, oh, I've got two, I'm sorry, I, I skipped two guys. I've got two guys to place here that came off of the turn track. Uh, this guy's going to definitely get in this city on the beginning. And I'm going to put this guy in this city because I don't want you walking into those cities. All right. So... Uh, this is difficult. One, two, three. I'll put him there. And these guys in Dnieper. Dnieperpetrovsk. Dnieperpetrovsk. I think they're going to stay there. And then that's it. That's my movement phase. Uh, now we get to my voluntary combats phase. And I say no. No. I say no. Uh, you may place a counterblow marker, however, in places that you would like to place a counterblow marker, discarding one card per marker. Um, putting a counterblow marker on my central out of supply guy, or or forcing him to attack. Oh, they can't attack uh, both. Pause. Can you can you pause for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do this before I think. Ooh, not a step back. Oh, during the German... Com oh, I'm sorry, I read the wrong thing. After the <laughs> Soviet move phase, you may move one supplied unit, not in enemy zone of control, or under a counterblow marker. Oh, up to half its movement factors rounded up. Move that there. Okay. Is movement the left or the right again? The right-hand one. 
Okay, so I could actually move it there. Uh, no, because you just crossed the sea. You're not allowed to cross uh, the the all water so hex sides. You can't go there either. And since it says you can't go into an enemy zone of control, that might be better used for the Panzer in the north because he can move three. I feel like I should have. Yes. I, I was kind of wishing that I could move. I thought I could move through that because they were adjacent hexes, but that, that would have been great. I gotta say, moving the Panzer in the north not a bad use of that card either. Where would you recommend I move him to? Well, well, I guess if you wanted to attack Leningrad, he could do this, and that gets him a lot closer. Because remember, next turn is going to be mud, so you're going to be reduced to three. And it already takes. Dur, dur, dur. Yeah, we'll do that. Why not? You know what? Alternatively, if you didn't want him to move to Leningrad, if you wanted to him to help in the in towards the south, you can move him two two hexes towards Smolensk. Leningrad's a tough nut to crack, no matter which way you slice it. What is the, what makes Leningrad so tough to crack? So, usually by the time you get there, I flip him over to his fortification side. Because that's a regional infantry unit. I didn't talk about that type of unit, but you can see it's got that little hex in the middle. That's called a regional mm -hmm. infantry unit. When it's on this side, it can move around. Starting on turn three, I can flip it over to the fortification side. And... Uh, it loses the ability to attack. That's what the white number means instead of the black number. Uh, however, when you attack it, if you look at the combat results table, it, if it, you get a defender retreat result, it's treated as no effect. Defender shattered is considered an exchange, which means he flips over to his weaker side. Defender destroyed is also considered an exchange. Okay. okay. So what that means is... You attack the unit, he takes a step loss and flips to his weaker side, then on my turn he flips to his stronger side. Then you attack him again, he flips to his weaker side, then on my turn he flips to his stronger side again. So, you either have to put him out of supply, or have to use, uh, like, a, like uh, a special card called Siege... Like, what are they called? Siege, um... Siege guns, or Siege artillery, that flips him on your turn before your combat. That's why Leningrad's really difficult to, to take, but he's not flipped yet. Okay. If you had killed the guy in the north without him getting stuck in Riga, you might have been able to get to Leningrad before uh, he, he gets flipped. But as it stands, it's going to be much easier to uh, have one of your guys uh, essentially go here to block the supplies and let him die out of supply. Um, but that's going to take a while to get there, obviously. Especially in the bad weather. Oh, Fort right, units also there. have no zone of control for what it's worth. All right, that's cool. That's still going to help you. So that was your card. Now we're on my turn, and we've got potential counter blows and things. I'm not declaring any voluntary attacks, so it's all you. I'm going to hit this counter blow thing. I just have to discard one card to do a counter Correct. blow? So counter blow forces... Forces me to attack you, with, so you which has be, a okay. chance of a counter attack... But if the odds are lower than 1 to 3 on my attack, then you would get uh, to counterattack automatically. If you placed a counterblow marker on both of those units in the middle, in the Pripet Marshes, um, then you would uh, automatically get a counterattack against my guy. It would cost you two cards to do it, but you would get it. Hello! What game are you guys playing? No retreat! The Russian front! I'm streaming it. It is an yeah, awesome I'm gonna do that. board game. I'm going to do that. Okay. I mean, you would also get a counterattack if you just use the Panzers, but it's you got better odds if you use both. Yeah, I'm going to use both. So All I right. got to discard, discard two cards. Okay. Okay. Uh, and now, any other counter blows that you would like to make? Nope, you could it. make counter blows on the city, but there's no point to doing it because it's going to die soon anyway because it's out of supply. Yeah. All right, so let's do this. Uh, it's way, way less than one to three. Uh, so it's an automatic counterattack, and you have your 21 to three, which is six to one, uh, and I don't get defensive, so just roll on the six to one table. Okay. A four is destroyed. So he goes to destroyed units box, and 
you can go ahead and advance after combat. You only get to move one space, but you still get to move. I'm sorry, you only get to move into the trees. Oh. Because the oh, trees stop your advancing after combat. So you have that same problem before. Uh, right, right, right. But okay. your infantry can now move out because they still, I believe... Nope, that takes him into supply. No, because he would trace to here. The city would trace to here. And then it can't trace anywhere. It can't go any further east from there. Because you're blocking here. And you're blocking there. Okay. So the, so he's still out of supply. And you have no movement to, to take that? To no, give supply? No. Not, not unless I have some special card. And I can tell you it's the combat round. I don't have any special card that lets me move there. Okay. So uh, that's the end of the okay. combat round, actually. Cool. So that was combat. We now go to removals. And this guy is removed. And you get a victory point for eliminating him. So he goes to the Remo surrendered unit box. And you gain okay. a victory point. And we also mark that as an event victory point with a little small circle. And... Uh, that's just a way to mark Where? things that aren't present on the map. It's on the one victory point spot. I just moved it from zero to one. Oh, okay. Basically, the square calculates your total of everything on the map plus that circle. Okay. So all the cities are things that we can recalculate because they're on the map. Finland is on the map. But anything that you get from cards or from surrenders or from the red things, anything that affects the... We have to track that separately from being on the map. That's what the circle's for. Okay. So that's the end. So now we're going to my detraining phase. So I've got two guys in the rail movement box I can detrain here. I think I'm going to put one... I'm, I'm, this guy's not here. I'm just moving him to the map so I can figure out where he goes. Uh, one is going to go... Not in an enemy zone of control within two hexes of supplied city. So I'm going to put him there. The other guy is also going to go within, sorry, three hexes of a supplied city. He'll go here. And he's not in his zone of control, so he's allowed to end his turn there as a rail move. Um, and that's it. Those guys detrained. And let's see. Uh, it is your, uh, no, new turn, new turn. So I got all these reinforcements that are going to come in on my turn. Uh, but you get two blitzes this turn. It is a mud turn, and on my turn I get to start fortifying things. This is also a turn where we check sudden death. Do you have more than 20 victory points? No. So it's, you don't win a sudden death victory. But if you did, you'd be doing so overwhelmingly well that it'd be very unlikely to be doing that well. Okay. Uh, so you're still, so you got two blitzes. We got two blitzes in your marker box at the top, so we're good to go. All right, uh, so we start with your hand. You've got one card left, so draw four. I wonder if this is making sense to anybody in the chat room slash Adalric. I mean, Adalric wasn't here for the whole explanation. I think Streisel was. Streisel's been here since we started. Streisel, do you understand the game now? Have you learned the game? I don't know if he's still there. He usually says goodbye. Oh, Rogers. Oh, Rogers. Is Rogers in here? Rogers is here. It's probably not listening. What's a replacement? A replacement is when you would need to bring a unit back uh, from the destroyed box. Okay. Or the surrender box. Right now, you don't really have to worry about that. Mm. And it is mud season now, right? It is mud season. Yeah, let's take a look at those effects. So in Mud Weather, all your units have three movement points maximum, regardless of what's on the actual counter, and you cannot advance after combat uh, m m further than just the defender's hex. And you don't get any uh, armor bonus shifts for being armor against infantry in the open. There's no defensive shifts. No special defensive shifts for Mud, no. Next turn, however, I get defensive shifts for snow, I think. Well, if I do this, can I drop a marker and then keep moving? Yes, you can, and you get a victory point, so I'll move it up to 17. Man, that poor army's going to get crushed. <laughs> He's done. 
Game over, man. You don't have to spend a blitz on that combat. Now, another consequence of the counter blow markers, by the way. Let's say mm -hmm. that you moved here, and you chose to attack uh, this guy here. Oops, wrong guy. Uh, you chose to attack this guy. I could place a counter blow marker, and now you're attacking both of those guys with that stack. What happens if, let's say I only had one unit and you do a counter blow? You would attack both, you could attack both of them together. Because they're both adjacent, oh. so that could be one battle where both of my guys are added together, essentially. Okay. So there is a way for a single hex to attack multiple hexes that are adjacent to each other. Well, two hexes, basically. Um, and there's a way for multiple hexes to attack a single hex. It's... Yeah, it sounds like risk mixed with Civ. Is that because it's got dudes on a map in, with, with, with hexes? <laughs> I should also point out that units can only participate in one combat, if that, I don't think I ever mentioned that, but uh, that is the case. Okay. Okay, let's see. Hmm. I don't think I have any possible counter blows, so we'll move right on to your combat. So you got two blitzes, you'll use them on both, I assume. Uh, so three... And they do is... carry over? Uh, you got two blitzes this turn. They don't hold over till next turn, no. Okay. Next so... turn you will get zero blitzes because it's the hard winter. Instead, I will get shock markers next turn, which are, are my version of blitzes. Okay. Well, since they don't carry over, I guess I will uh, use them both. All right. So which one do you want to start with? Start with the north one. All right. That's the 21 to 3, which is already 6 to 1, actually. So you don't really need a blitz there. Did you want to move that? You know, move one of those guys to attack Smolensk instead and, and use a blitz? Um to help out well, there, let's, let's I guess let's calculate the bottom one first. Or eight. Uh, Twenty-two to three. So yeah. I mean, I, I was just I thinking. For example, you don't need all those guys on that attack. You could have done this to attack Smolensk with a eh, reasonable twelve, two to one with a blitz. Eh, it's possible. Yeah, let's let's do it. Let's do that. That sounds like a good idea. All right. So I think you still have ridiculous... Uh, you got 14 to 3 in the south. So that's still uh, 4 to 1. Um, so which one you want to do first? You want to do try the Smolensk we'll, we'll attack? Um, sure. Smolensk attack is 2 to 1. So it could wind up not working for you, but it's, it's probably worth a try. And yeah, that's, we'll do, that's we'll with do. a blitz. It's 2 to 1. Because it counteracts yeah. the city. Yeah, we'll do it with a blitz. Any cards you could use? Uh, let me double check. Usually they'll be pretty clear if they're used in battle. Yeah, but Risk doesn't have a supply system, Adalric. <laughs> Risk doesn't have a supply system. It doesn't have zones of control. You can't just move up next to things. You can't move past things. You have to, you have to respect... Okay. Their place. I'm. I have not. No cards. I'm going to play at this point. Okay. Go ahead and roll on the two to one. Need a five or four, five or six will help you. A three. Well, kind of helps you. That's an exchange. Um, so. Well, hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Oh. Okay. I'm going to do this. I'm going to force myself to re-roll. Okay. Knights cross wearers. All right. Go ahead and re-roll. Oh. Ah. <laughs> well, it's it's arguably better. An exchange would have forced you to flip over one of your guys to their weaker side. It would have also killed my guy, but it would not have allowed you to advance into Smolensk. So this way, your units didn't take any losses, at least. Exchanges are typically good for the Soviet Union, because I tell you what, it takes one card to get my unit back on the map. It takes two to flip yours back over to its stronger side. All right, so now let's go to the next part. Uh, the south is a 4-1 to one without a blitz, I think. I'm sorry, the middle one there. And then the other one, I think you've got 6-1 to one without worrying about a blitz. It's 7 plus uh, 8 is 15 
plus another, that's 22 to three. three. So yeah, you absolutely have six to one down there. So you can use the blitz on the middle and make it five to one. Okay, we'll do that. Ready? Yep. Oh, we got a six on the five to one. That's destroyed. So he is gone. And now you may advance after combat. However, it's mud, so you can only advance into that defending hex. Okay. And now the bottom one, which you definitely have six to one on. I don't have any defensive terrain, so go ahead and roll six to one. A six. He's also destroyed. And you may also advance into that hex. Well, that's not great. Right. It's weird. It's weird how destroying a unit is not as good as making it surrender. Yeah. I, guess I find that really counterintuitive. I guess the terminology isn't great. When you think of defender destroyed, so you got three different levels. Defender shattered basically means you force them in a full route. They're in full retreat, but they're not they haven't taken so many casualties that they need massive re reinforcements. They've just been so shattered by the attack, they are in full retreat. You weren't quite able to keep up with them and really, like, encircle units and just, you know, chunk them down in terms of casualties. Um, so they come back the next turn. It just takes some time for them to get reorganized and brought back to the front as a functional unit. Destroyed means that... They, now, a destroyed unit has to kind of retreat first, and then it's destroyed. It takes a step loss. Um... For the Soviets, that means that they're destroyed every time. They get a full... They, they, they're fully destroyed. If your units... If you if I attack you and get a DD result, your units retreat two steps and then take a step loss. So it's not the same for you. That means one section of your army took some casualties. Uh, in my sense, you know, it means one section of my army took a casualties after they retreated, and there, there now are so few of them that they're not really functional as a unit anymore. I have to s fill them with more men to bring them back up to strength. Surrendered units, well, a surrendered unit never has to, uh, never gets back. Those guys that surrendered, they're in a POW camp somewhere in Poland now. Uh, they, they can't go and be part of the army anymore. So a destroyed yes. unit, imagine that some of those destroyed guys can come back as the new army with a bunch of fresh replacements in them. But the surrendered unit, that's why the surrendered unit is better. Uh, it's, it's better to force your unit, to, your enemy to surrender because A, you get more victory points. B, it takes me two cards to get them out of the surrendered box. And C, uh, they give you the victory point. Did I say victory point? Victory point's good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I guess the way that I would... I mean, destroyed is such a terrible term for that because you're right. You're right. You know, it's almost like other games use it, the term defender disrupted, and that might be better. But yeah. So anyway, um, see, I'd almost say shattered is good term, and then uh, defender routed would be the routed the last would probably one. be a good one. Yeah, or defender takes casualties, defender casualties, or defender attrition would be another one that works well. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, Streisel says Monopoly is terribly infuriating because it never ends. You know why it never ends? Because nobody plays the game by the damn rules. Monopoly played by the rules actually is still quite a long game, but it's, it's less long <laughs> than the game that people play, which is Monopoly with all these house rules, like free parking. The game is supposed to suck money out of the game. Like, money's supposed to disappear over time and go into fewer and fewer people's hands because that's how the game ends. People have to go bankrupt for the game to end, but when people do free parking, all the money that's getting sucked out due to tax taxes and stuff instead goes back into the game and people don't get kicked out. So that's the reason Monopoly takes forever. It's because you're playing it wrong. Um, but it's also kind of a crappy game. Anyway, uh, where were we? we but were... You, really, you really don't have any kind of an opinion about this at all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we were just moving on uh, to the Soviet player turn. Uh, supply. Uh, I think everything's still in supply. Oh, checking supply. Uh, well, yes. hang on. I gotta discard my cards here. I got Zukov. Oh, wait, I thought you checked supply to make sure at the end anyway, still. Or do you only remove if there's a, no supply? You yeah. only remove if there's no supply. So the only thing you care about checking okay. at the end is units with a no supply marker. Uh, okay, okay. 
That's not super useful. All right, so I discarded down to two. Now I'm drawing four. Oh, great patriotic war. I must play this card immediately upon drawing it. Reshuffle the deck and discard pile together to form a new draw pile. I do not receive a replacement card. Well, fantastic. All right, so I'm down a card. I want to hold on to Zukov. He's good. All right, now uh, we go to the flip step. And this is the third turn, so I'm now allowed to fortify my Leningrad fort. So I'm flipping that over. It's costing me a card. I will. Oh, I can't use Katyusha's because it's got a star on it, so I'll, I'll discard that one to flip the Leningrad fort. Now we go to the placement step. I've got four reinforcements, and actually the mud is not a reinforcement. That stays up here somewhere. Uh, where'd it go? Undo what I just did. All right. It stays up around in this area. So I've got three replacements. The Moscow Fort is going to go in Moscow. The Sevastopol Fort is going to go in Sevastopol. i got to say, those are both good places for those things. I almost always put them in those places. And then the Cadre is a new thing that I'm going to put over here. And the way that Cadres work in the Cadre Units Available box up at the top of the screen, uh, above Konigsberg. Uh, cadres... As soon as a unit is removed from the map to satisfy an exchange or a destroyed step loss, I can immediately replace it with a cadre. And this helps, for example, to defend a city so that you can't take it in advance after combat. The cadre is, well, we had these guys in reserve and we're just going to throw them into the hole that was made by these guys. So um, that represents the uh, the units which they threw in where they had like 4,000 guns but only 2,000 people? Sort of. The cadre also represents the sort of shell of an army that you can build a stronger real army group around. So let's say, for example, uh, we look at Kharkov here. And let's say I'm going to bring this unit back from the destroyed box. I'll put it back up over there in a second. Let's say you attack this unit and you get a defender destroyed result. Technically, what's supposed to happen is he retreats two steps and then takes a step loss, which means he goes to the destroyed box. And you could then advance after combat with armor and take Kharkov. But if instead, after that exchange, I could pull my cadre and put it where he was destroyed, now I've blocked you from taking Kharkov. And the cadre can be used as a replacement location. So if bringing anybody back from the destroyed box, I can put them where the cadre is, and the cadre goes on the turn uh, track uh, a couple of turns ahead. I think it's four turns? One turn. So that's how you use cadres. You throw them in in a place where you're like, oh, crap, this unit just left a big hole. As it dies due to a DD or an exchange... I can throw this in there to help, and then I can put a real unit in its place later on my turn. You will also get a cadre. I think you get one on the next turn. Um, nope, the turn after that. So two turns, you get a cadre to use when you want to. Okay. Uh, so I put out all my replacements that I got for free. Now, uh, they're talking about Uno now. My God. Seriously. Uno? Uno? Play spades, at least you're going to play a card game. All right. Let's see. I'm going to discard this card and this card because both of them have the red star, so they can't do anything except help me for discards to put out some replacements. And this is a disorganized markers alt three. So I got to put a guy there and a guy here. Oops. Alt three on him, too. How do I want to bring... I think I want to bring one more guy out. And I got to discard one of these... I'll discard this one, even though I really, really like that card. I'll put that there, and he also has a disorganized marker. Okay, that is my placement step. I am not going to organize any of them. For all I care, they can sit there with their disorganized markers. I'm also not going to move anybody. So, yeah, that's pretty much the end of my turn. You could only put a counterblow marker on your guys outside of Smolensk. And that would be a 1 to 2 I would be attacking you on. Pretty decent chance of a counterattack. About 50%, actually. And actually, no, it would be 1 to 3 
Because do I have to, greater than one to two. I have to discard a card to do that, right? If you wanted to, yeah, you could discard a card to give a two-thirds chance of a counterattack into Smolensk. On the two-to-one table, unless you have special cards. Alright, I'm gonna discard this card. Okay. Oh man, General Mud! I love General Mud! It's almost as good as General Winter. Alright, so you put a counter blow marker there. Uh, so, uh, I have pause. to attack you. Yes, so I'm gonna play this. Counteroffensive. So play during a Soviet attack prior to the die roll. The combat result becomes an automatic counterattack and must be mandatorily conducted. Wow, that is a powerful card. You could do that if I'm attacking you on a 6 to 1 table. Well, not a 6 to 1. You wouldn't want to counterattack on a 6 to 1 table. That's why it's mandatory. But anyway, you used it when you're supposed to. You get a 2 to 1 attack on uh, on the city, and there's no shift for the city. Okay, so then I get to roll, right? Uh, no, because I'm playing a card. Ha ha ha. General oh, okay. Zukov. Click on the card decks, and you can see the one that I discarded. Uh, yeah, I already have it open. It says, I can either use the German CRT for up to two Soviet attacks, or I can force the German player to use the Soviet combat results table for one Axis attack. So now, instead of using two to one on your table, you're using two to one on my table. Which is definitely worse than, than yours. So go so ahead and roll. Um, I'm going to play this, I think. Hedgehogs. No, it's not a Soviet attack. This is your attack on me. But, okay, so I... Okay, I can just drag that back up. Cool. Okay. Um, I thought you were so, going to play a um, different one. Anyway, go ahead. All right, so I roll? Yep. On your table? Yes. Got to roll high. A five will do it. That's a defender retreats, even on my table. Okay, so I have to retreat two hexes. I will go here and here. And you may now advance after combat and take the city. And that gives you a victory point. You're now at 18. One, two, three, four, five. You're six away from having an automatic victory in two turns. All right, that was the only combat, right? I'm going to take these markers off. And... Uh, we go to the training. I didn't entrain anybody this time, so we go straight to the new game turn. So the new game turn is snow. I get a strategic reserve marker, which I place in my cadre available units box. And then I get these guys, which I'm going to play on my turn as reinforcements. And we are now into snow. Uh, now... The November-December turn was such a harsh winter. I get three shock markers. You get no blitz markers this turn. You'll get more back in the summer. Uh, there we go. My shock markers normally count as a single... Uh... Oh, hang on. Let me double check. Wow, I don't like ever get reinforcements. <laughs> no, you don't. But you started with the strongest ever thing in the world, basically. Really strong. Okay. Where's mud? Okay, good. We didn't screw anything up. <laughs> uh, so, normally my shock markers give me a one column shift for my bonus when I attack you, just like your blitz markers do. However, mm -hmm. on this specific turn, they count as two shifts because this was a particularly bad winter and uh, the Germans were unprepared for it. On all future snow turns, they work normally in terms of uh, they just give me a single column shift. Okay. Uh, however, there's also an event. Pearl Harbor happened on this turn, the red thing, which means I gain one event victory point, which means you lose one total victory point. And... Now we move on to your turn. Let's talk about the effects of snow. Uh, 4 MP um, tanks do get one. Uh, all units will do a, a two hex advance after combat, but tanks don't get their third hex. That's what that means. 
um, four MP max, and uh, snow gives a defense shift to the Soviets only. Okay. Now there were some errata because I guess the Soviets were having too hard a time surviving. In snow, the German player uses the Soviet combat table uh, for all his attacks. And on the first start turn of the game, the shock markers provide two shifts to the right instead of the usual one. So all of your attacks in this are on my combat table for the next few turns because it's all snow and long winter and stuff. Lovely. So, uh, with that having been said, you can now uh, draw your cards. You've also got one that is shown to me and unmasked. You can flip that back over so I don't know about the hedgehogs. <laughs> so you can still make some attacks. You just have to make sure you have very high odds because my table sucks. Jeez, even five to one, you have a one-third chance of an exchange. I have no cards in my hand, too. So I can't do any counter blow markers this turn. For what it's worth. And I still have that guy in the surrender box. He's one of my strong guys. Damn it. And let's do a supply check while you're looking there. My guys are fine there, fine there, fine there, fine there. All my guys seem fine. I think all your guys are fine also. Especially because you just took Smolensk, so that gives you an extra supply source in the middle there. Yep, all people in supply. Um, now the Solim whatever Smolensk thing. Yeah. I is there something special about cities not counting for being like basically can I move my guys to here? No. Okay, so the city doesn't add anything extra or change anything in that nope. regard. That's actually the reason that usually the uh, the Soviet player has their units so that the Zoks basically do this. And you can't get to Moscow without trying to stick these guys. And if you kill these guys, you can't advance after combat except into their hex because they're in the forest. That's what makes it such a good defensive position. Um, that doesn't mean you're not going to like try to surround them and, and put them out of supply and make bad things happen. Uh, it just means that it'll slow you down on the way to Moscow. <laughs> this, this is a speed bump position. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah these two patches of forest as in my experience in this game if the soviet player doesn't fortify these two patches of forest with some guys by the time you get to where you are bad things happen they drive right into moscow because i have to hold you off i want to turn that for moscow fort over to its stronger side uh the fort side uh, but i can't do that if you go and attack it right now that's why those guys are there Okay, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, that guy's gonna die, probably. All right, interesting. Okay, so that looks good. And I don't have any counter blows I can play, so we're just on to your combats. So let's do some numbers. Six and six is 12, and another 12 is 24 to four. That is six to one. I get one shift for being in the forest and one shift for it being winter. So it's on four to one on my table. Okay. Which is pretty much I the have... best you can hope for in winter. So just roll? Yep. A four is a defender retreats. Hmm. All right. Now you may advance after combat with two of those units. I think I'm happy with that. Okay. Yeah. Then now the other. 
and that is 8 and 8 is 16 plus, <clears throat> excuse me, 7. Uh, gets us to 23 to 3. That is still 6 to 1. I'm in a city, and there's the winter shift, so it's back to 4 to 1 on my table. A 3 is an exchange. No, 4 to 1 is a retreat, sorry. Even on my table, a 3 is still a good number. Uh, I have to retreat here. And then I'll go there. And you may advance in to capture the city, and I will give you a victory point. Bloop. All right, that is it for that, right? Now let's see if the Soviets can summon a counterattack. All right. So first is the flip step. Oh, I got to draw my cards first, actually. One, two, three, four. General Winter, play this card immediately and draw a new one. If the next turn has variable weather, flip it to its weather marker side to snow if available. It's already snow. Uh, it's the long winter, so nothing happens there except I don't really get to take advantage of that card. All right, uh, now I will play, I will discard this card and this card to flip the Moscow Fort and the Sevastopol Fort. Those are both very important. But now I have one card left over. Uh, you know what? I'll play it. It is Allied Lend-Lease. Play during your organization phase, which is right now, to draw two cards. Oh, and they suck. And I think I will use these to discard both and get my surrendered uh, unit back out of the surrendered unit box. But I don't have a lot of places to put it. I guess I'll put it in Tula. And then I've got some replacements here that I get to place for free in cities. But where? I guess I'll put this one in Kalinin. And this one I am going to put in Rostov. All right, now that is my placement step. Which one? Oh. But this Tula can't fight because I just brought it back from the destroyed box, even though it's my strong guy. That sucks. But I know what I can do with him. All right. Uh, let's go movement. All right. One, two, one, uh, one. And then Tula's going to go one, two to take up defensive position at that city. Uh, Even with that unorganized, oh, the unorganized only affects combat, right? Yep, and he so I'm, that's why I didn't bring him into attack. I guess I'll do one, two, three, and then this guy will go here to just back him up, just backing him up. That's all. Oh, but now I've left that open. Uh, Shazbot. I'm going to put this guy way in the south near Sevastopol. He's going in the rail movement box. Because he's in supply. And uh, therefore he's going in the rail movement box. And damn, I think that's it. That's all I can do. I've got three shock markers, but I can really only attack, target two things. Um, so I will put a target marker here and a target marker there. You may discard cards to place counter blows if you like. One per? Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of thought that might happen. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work out. That's why keeping your armies together allows you to take advantage of that. If you separate them out too much, then they can be attacked without any counter blow help. Hey, Cutter. I forgot that, uh, did I play Triumph and Tragedy on stream? I think I might have. Um, I haven't played it on Vassal in a while, no. The playtest that they had going, um, they kind of ended the, the, the external playtest and they made a few more changes to their local thing and played with that a little bit before it shipped. Um, so I'm not really sure what the changes were since the last time I played it. 
but I'm interested to to read the updated rule book and see what was changed. Okay. You're good? You yes. Um Okay. Which attack are you gonna do first? That's a good question. Um there's five of them, and I only have three shock markers. I'll attack the third panzer up in the, the top one, the northernmost one. Um, it's okay. eight to six, so that gives us one-to-one um, one chart. Okay. I am going to play this because I want to see what it does. Oops, I looked at the wrong thing. Uh, hedgehogs. Both players roll a die. Loser takes one step loss. In case of a die, both take a step loss and roll again. Oh, okay. Uh, I roll a die. I got a three. You roll a die. All right. Loser takes a step loss. Um, all my guys only have one step, so I guess that guy bites it into the destroyed box. All right, so... Now this is a counter blow, so you don't get defensive shifts at least, but it's 5 to 12, which is on the 1 to 3 situation. But I'm going to use a shock marker, which brings it up to 1 to 1. Do you have any uh, cards you want to commit to this? Uh, no. Okay, on the Soviet 1 to 1 table, I get a 6, which is a defender retreats, baby. Hold, hold, hold. Holding. Hold at all costs. Oh, <laughs> hold at all costs. Wow, that's you got some damn useful cards. All DR results are retreated as an exchange result for the remainder of the Soviet combat phase. At any time. Oh, damn, that's a good play. All right. Well, my guy's going to the destroyed box. Thanks for <laughs> playing, so Southwest <laughs> Army Group. <laughs> now, one of your guys does have to uh, flip to its weaker side. Um, you can kind of flip them both I, over and take a look. Can I get a recommendation on that? Well, let's see. Uh, that goes from 7 to 5, and that goes from 5 to 4. So probably having the 4th Panzer flip over, you lose less overall combat capability. They don't lose any movement because they're both armor. Um, okay. And on your next turn... Is it turn th 4? Yes. On your next turn, you'll be able to pay 2 cards to flip him back to his strong state. Okay. All right, let's move further south. Which one of these do I actually have a chance of winning? That might be the one that I use the stupid markers on. All right, uh, so three to seven is just barely one to three. Uh, so I'm going to use my a shock marker on that one. This is the one against the Romanian group, the south Army group versus the Romanian and the second army. Okay. So I get it at one to one. Do you have any cards you want to play? No. All right. One to one is a two. And that's a counterattack. Now, a counterattack is optional. So you can counterattack me at two to one odds if you want. Um, there are no terrain shifts, which include weather, I believe. Because weather is located in the terrain effects combat chart. Okay, so it's just a straight two to one? If you'd like to, yes. It seems like a I good thing. I will roll it. A two. Two. That puts a counter blow marker on the attacking unit, so it goes on me. Okay, so what happens now? <laughs> on future turn, you get to attack me. Uh, you have to attack me if you're next to me, is what that means. It's a continuation. It's like the combat's not over. It's inconclusive. We'll see what happens next turn. Okay. All right. So these guys are attacking three to eight. That is also one to three. This one I am also going to use. My, I'm going to use my last shock marker on this one because it's a city. Uh, and so that brings me back up to one to one. Anything for you to commit? Any cards? Nope. All right. I'm on one to one. I got a five, which is an exchange. So my guy's going to the destroyed box, and you must take a step loss from one of those guys. It looks like they're probably both the same. So really, who do you hate more, the 17th Army or the 16th Army? Who let you down in that fight? Oh, man, it was, uh, it's sad to say, but it was totally the 17th Army. Yeah. 
They're just yeah, jealous they, that they that they that they were chosen so late. They were formed later. They had <laughs> less uh, less uh, opportune choice selection. It was bad. It was just bad all around. Yeah. All right. The stand final... by. Stand by. Stand by. What did I roll? I rolled a. I rolled a five. Is that right? Uh, that's what it says. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot to account for the fact that you were defending a city, so it actually goes to one to two. So that's actually a counter blow, not an exchange. Oh, so that means I get to roll against you if uh, I choose. It means I put a counter blow marker here, and you don't lose your guy. Oh, okay. That's not nearly as advantageous. Yeah. Well, it kind of is, because paying those cards to flip units over, you already got to flip those guys over. That's literally your entire card draw next turn would have been spent to flip your guys over. And if you don't keep up with that, they all just get weaker and weaker, and then they start having to die. It's not good. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see. The caucuses is just a straight one to three. Uh, they don't have a shock to declare. So a one on the one to three is a counterattack. You would counterattack at two to one against the caucuses army. Rolling. And uh, it's on my chart because... I think we, we didn't do that right last time. It's on my chart because it um, it's in oh, the winter. Yeah. Uh, so that's a nothing. Counter. Two to one, a one is a nothing. Nothing happens. Okay. All right. Well, that was a maximally effective super counterattack that the Soviets pulled off there. Oh, yeah. We almost kind of maybe would have taken Smolensk back, but it didn't happen. All right, so now we do uh, removals and detraining. I put my guy in a train, didn't I? I did. I put him on yes. a train, and he is going to come out in Vorozneth. Just to make sure nothing fishy goes on there. All right, so uh, we move the turn marker on to the next turn, if you'd like to continue. Uh, sure. One more turn, and then I got probably got to call it bed after, uh, after this turn. Uh, so you get a uh, cadre, so that goes right in the cadre available units box. So uh, you could potentially use that uh, the next time you lose a unit to a step loss. You have to re if you remove a unit from the map. You haven't removed any units from the map yet. All right, I get three shocks. You may begin flipping your units back with replacements. And during this long winter specifically, uh, when you attack me, I get two defensive shifts due to the winter. Hang on, we were missing counter blow markers here. By the way, those counter blow markers means I don't get those defensive shifts through the winter. Those are important. Uh, okay. Um, okay. And uh, so, yeah, so I get my three shock markers back, and you discard down to two, and then draw four. Okay, fickle weather, play this card immediately. Uh, it is. If this turn has variable weather, then flip its weather marker. Man, you're losing it. Uh, nope, January, February does not have fickle weather. That's one of the few that don't. I think. <laughs> I think long winter. Alright, um, how do I see how many cards you have in hand? Uh, click on my hand. I have zero cards. Oh, okay. Well. I don't get to place that... any more counter blows. Basically. You're going to have to okay. attack those units down there, but they don't get the terrain benefits. You're probably not going to want to attack... Anything unless you have, even if you have overwhelming odds, it's three shifts if my guys have any terrain benefits. And you're using the Soviet combat results table. So make that, take that into account as you check. So supply check, everybody's in supply uh, for the pretty much most part here. Uh, you got your reinforcement, it was the cadre. Uh, flip step, you can discard two cards to flip that guy that was damaged back to his strong side. Okay. I'm flipping him. Okay. And then go ahead and move on to your movement. Oh, jeez. Now, before making the attack on Moscow, I'm not saying you're making a bad move, because getting next to Moscow is hard enough. Um, but before making the attack on Moscow, keep in mind the city is a shift. The hex, the, the fact that it's an objective hex is also a shift. I get two shifts for winter, and... Uh, Listen, it's the end of the game for all intents and purposes, because you're going to head to bed. Well, yeah, but we'll save it. We can continue this game. 
Oh, well. That's the beauty of playing it. uh, I mean, if you wanted to. Okay. It's not impossible, and it might be really good. (laughs) Actually, well, it's also a fort, so it kind of ignores Defender Retreat's results. But anyway, I digress. He digresses. Okay. So, oh, I never put a marker down. A marker down. Oh, in Smolensk? Yeah. Ah, gotcha. I think we covered it, though. You I'm gained sure one, two, three, four, five, six. So you should be at 18. That's exactly where you are. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so I have to have something attack those southern places, right? If there's something yes. near them. If there, you could move away from them, but if you stay next to them, they have to attack. But the good news is I don't get defensive shifts with counter blow markers. Because this is a continuation from the previous battle. It's going back and forth. We don't have prepared fortifications in the snow. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to do this and this. And... And Cutter, you know what I am that. really interested in is uh, Churchill just shipped. That's actually on its way to me. I'm holding off on, on Triumph and Tragedy to see what uh, they've done with it. But uh, Churchill, I definitely want to pick up. Oh, okay, so we're going to do Moscow barked. first. All right, so let's see how this plays out. Hopefully you got a battle okay. card that'll help you out. So I've got I four, you've got 12. I'm going to play this right off. Siege Artillery, that's exactly what you needed. Okay, that is very helpful. That flips Moscow over to a much weaker side. So now it's yes. six to one instead of four to one that you're starting yes. at. And uh, I'm also going to play this. Luftwaffe, that's very good. Uh, so give us a second now. You start at six to one. Two shifts for winter brings it to four to one. Two shifts for it being a city and an objective hex brings it to two to one. And then Luftwaffe support brings it back to three to one. And I might okay. be. Now, uh, you, you're, you're finish, finish computing those odds for me. Okay, during any single attack. So Siege Artillery didn't count as a battle card. I think you can only have one battle card per fight. Each player can have one battle card. <laughs> Siege Artillery didn't count, though, because it said play at any time. One combat um, support marker to the battle. Because that well, attacker followed by the defender may each play one event card. So, you're fine. If you had another card to play, you basically have to choose between Luftwaffe and any other cards that you might play in this in this combat. Okay, well, without using the Luftwaffe, what does that put my odds at? Uh, I think it's 2 to 1. Because it started at 6. It went down 2 so, for the winter to 4. It went down 2 more for the terrain. Uh, you're not crossing a river, right? Nope. So, nope. it's at 2 to 1. Luftwaffe brought you back up to 3 to 1, and you're on my table. Okay, so I'm not going to use Luftwaffe. Instead, I'm going to use this. Ooh, Guderian. Play before one attacks this attack at two to better. Yes, if this result is automatically... Wow, that combination of cards just gained you Moscow. So Defender has to retreat. And you can advance after combat. Bam! That is not something I expected you to do on your first play. (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, there are a couple things that happen. Um, we have to put this out somewhere to remind me that I get minus one card draw because we lost the capital. Two, you got a victory point. And three, you got an objective hex. That was not supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I thought I was doing pretty well so far um, because I got all this, all the forts flipped over before anybody got to them. And uh, I kind of stalled you outside of Moscow before the big turn in the winter. And then you just said, nope, coming in. Full speed (laughs) ahead. That one count. No, you know what? It was two turns of ridiculously good card plays. Because that thing in Smolensk should have been a victory for me. Instead, you turned it into an exchange. And I was stuck. And then that cleared the way to Moscow. Wow. Okay. So that happened. Um... Let's do these other ones, I guess. I'm guessing I'm going to fare much better in these. So we've got 6 there. That's 12. That is 19 to 4, which is 4 to 1, unfortunately. Uh, And I'm in a forest, which brings it down to 3 to 1. 
And then there's the two shifts due to the winter, which brings us to three to two on my table. Go ahead and roll. Three to two? Okay. Well, since it's already pretty terrible, um, I'm going to just do, do this. Make it the... Go off the support, make it two to one. Yeah. That yeah. improves your odds pretty significantly. All right, so we're going to roll. That's ex- Wow, the Luftwaffe made it. That got it to DR, uh, and now I have to retreat. Uh, I'm going to go here and there. You may advance into the hex. No, there's no vassal module for Churchill yet. That's too bad. I like. Uh, I really like what Churchill looks like it's doing. All right, so that's that combat. Let's go down to these in the south. Which ones would you like to resolve first? Uh, we'll resolve east to west. Okay. So that unit is a three. Uh, you've got just those same two attack. guys as last yeah, time. Yeah, we do the same attacks we did all the way across. Okay, so eight to three is two to one, and I get two shifts for the wind for this particularly bad winter. So that brings it one to one. That's a terrible attack. It okay. is a terrible attack, especially on mine. It would still be an okay attack on your table, but it's especially bad on my table. A five is an exchange. Probably the best you could have hoped for. That gets my guy out of your way and into the destroyed unit box. Uh, one of you guys flips, and they stay where they are. No no advance after combat on an exchange. Okay. All right. Now, these ones are going to be better for you because I don't get any shifts. Uh, that is eight to three. That's a two to one straight up on my table. And do you roll or do I? You do. Because these are still your attack phase. Even though it's... Counter blows the, are... They're mechanically resolved as you attacking me. Narratively, they are me attacking you, or in this case, a continuation of the previous attacks. That's an explanation for why terrain doesn't matter. Okay. All right, and what was the... Was it two to one? Two to one on my table. A five is really good. This, That's... Damn it. This, uh, so defender retreats. I will go behind this river. Yeah, no, I'll go here instead. All right, and you may advance after combat one space there if you'd like. Um, I think I'm gonna hold right there. Okay, probably not a bad idea. If you'd gone too far out, you wouldn't have been able to use counter blows to stop me from hitting you next turn or this turn. Also, supply. Oh, no. I didn't want to... Well, I don't really want to lose that city. Yeah. That's the other major thing. Well, to clarify, if you go here, even if nothing else happens, this, there's no way this guy gets there. There's no way that happens. There's no way anybody oh, okay. gets in there without fighting you. But it's possible that we could fight you. Basically, what happens here is... If you're in here, I'm going to try and come in at you again, maybe with all the three units, and you'll have to play the counter blow markers in order to, mm-hmm. to, to siphon off some of the power. If you go here, I can hit you, and you probably I, I can probably hit you without you being able to counter blow much. But if you lose, um, I can't advance into the city after the combat because the city isn't the defended hex. So that's kind of the trade off there. If you have the cards and you want to use the counter blows, keep them right there in the city. If you don't, you might push them forward so that even if I attack you, I can't take the city. Because it's mud, okay. or snow rather. It's actually long winter, I should say. And you can't do multi-hex advance after combat in long winter. Okay. Well, I don't have the cards, but I'm going to keep them there just, just in because case. it yeah. seems like it's I probably uh, won't be able to do it anyway. We'll see. All right, now you're doing the, the, the attack there, and that is 7 to 3. So it's another 2 to 1 straight up. A 5 is another good one. Defender Even on retreats. my table, that's the defender retreats. Uh, he's going to retreat two hexes to Stalino. Although he can't cause too much chaos. The worst he could do is do like this. But even yeah, then... Yeah, but then I do this. Yeah, and then he's cut off. Exactly. So even though it might put your guys out of supply for that turn, it doesn't do too much. All right. So I'm well, doing no. okay in the south. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Doing okay in the south. But we lost Moscow. The center just folded. Ugh. All right. North and south are okay. Center folded, probably not the best outcome. So that's the end of your turn, right? Uh, so we go mm-hmm. to removals and detraining, and then we go to the Soviet player turn. So let's get some friggin' cards in my hand. How about we do that? Play after any German advance after combat. That's okay. I feel like that are the freaking nice to have. Rolled. 
That's useless. Play before one German attack. Well, these cards would have been nice to have last fucking turn. <laughs> All right. Well, it is what it is. I'm going to have to pay these cards to get people out of the thing anyway. So I'm going to pay this. And I'm going to pay these two to try and get some guys back. It's going to be this guy and this guy. I didn't get any re fucking reinforcements this turn. Everything came in last turn. I got nothing. Um, where am I going to put these guys? This is the... I get, I get some more Hungarians yeah. next turn. Huh. What the hell's the Moscow fort going to do? It can't fortify now. It's not in place. Um, I'll put this guy in Tula. Because, <laughs> you know, now you're out of supply. Not that it's going to be hard for you to get back in supply, but, but I can dream. Um, and I guess this guy will go in Gorky. We can make a counterattack on Moscow and see how well that works out. Wait. Uh, but in order oh, to no, do no, 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 because this, this is placement step, okay. This is the placement, uh, the placement step. Uh, they're disorganized, and these guys are disorganized. Uh, okay, I'm gonna discard. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna go a little crazy here. I'm gonna discard two more cards during my organization step to uh, make it so these guys can attack this turn. The two new guys. Yeah, and I'm just gonna move this card thing out of the way. You're still gonna get two defensive shifts because of the fucking city and the ugh, and my fucking thing sucks. All right, so I got no reinforcements. I got no more cards. I can't bring this guy out of the destroyed box, so we move straight to my movement phase. Uh, I could cut more guys out of supply. What are you getting next turn? Are you getting uh, blitzes next turn? Are you going to get a blitz next turn? Yeah, I don't... Is that a good plan? <laughs> Taking back Smolensk, is that a good plan? It's not going to last for a whole turn. You're just going to crush it. Maybe. It's worth trying. Uh, so I'm going to go back and take back Smolensk. So you lose one VP. I'm going to put one guy in the rail movement box. Then... Did you get one less draw? I did not. I couldn't do that. So Gorky is going to have to stay disorganized. Shit. In that case, I don't think I can do the Smolensk thing. So here, let me give you your thing back. Uh, drop control marker. There we go. And I give you your point back. All right. Well, if Gorky can't participate, I'll do this. And I'll do that. And this, and this. Well, Gorky was supposed to be in there to help, but uh, <laughs> he can't do it. <laughs> he can't do it. So I'll do this. Now we got Moscow completely <laughs> surrounded. I still don't think it's going to be enough with my shitty table. So let's see. That's five. Actually, um, let me finish all my other moves here. Uh, that's it. That's pretty much all my other moves. Um, so my target marker is that. Um you could choose a counter blow if you'd like, but there's probably not any good ones down in the south there. Oh, you're out of cards, so it doesn't matter. All right, so that is 5, 10, 15, and 7 is 22 against your 12. So I don't even have 2 to 1 on my shitty table. <laughs> I have 3 to 2, and you get 2 shifts for the defender, so I'm rolling on the one to two table. I have to get a six. If I get a six, it'll be epic, but if I don't, it will suck. I got a three. <laughs> three is nothing happens. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> if I got a six, you would have lost both of those armies. They would have been destroyed, because if they can't retreat, they have to... I think maybe they take step losses. Hang on. The defender must move his units two hexes further away from the battle. They cannot zigzag... Units cannot retreat into blah, blah, blah. If a unit is prohibited from retreating, it's eliminated instead. Yeah, they would have it's all died. The they would have all died. It would have been a massive victory for the Soviet uh, people in the Great Patriotic what is, War. What does eliminated mean? That means they go to the destroyed unit box. 
Okay. They don't take step losses. They just go straight to the destroyed unit box. Uh, okay. So now you're going to get a blitz next turn. It's going to be mud, so you're no longer using my shitty table. My guess is you're going to crush your way back into supply. <laughs> but it would have been great. It was a risk worth taking, I think. All right, the guy in Gorky gets organized. Uh, what else do I have here? Um, combat, we did that. Removals, detraining. I got to detrain my guy. He is going to detrain in this city here to try and hold it. And that is my turn. So uh, we will... I'm going to put the turn marker on top of the stack on six. Um, we would check to see if you had 24 victory points. It would be an auto win, but you don't. So it wouldn't win next time. Um, and uh, we can pick this up on turn six uh, tomorrow the, or sometime in the future. Yeah. Does the event VP, does that, is that supposed to be on one? It was on one, one. But then if you look at turn four, there was a uh, red event there, the Pearl Harbor thing. That gives the Soviets one point. And that oh, okay. detracts from you, and that's tracked on the circle for event VPs. Because okay. you did cause so, the one surrender. If you hadn't caused the one surrender, then it would have said uh, Soviet won. Oh, uh, okay. So they countered each other, and now it's back at zero. Okay, cool. Well, this is pretty interesting. Well, <laughs> it sure is. <laughs>